Please, uh, good evening and welcome to this, uh, the April 13th, 2009, regular monthly meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. It appears that once again I've been able to uh, fill the auditorium. Uh, I honestly didn't believe it exuded that much charisma, but thank you anyway. Um, I will ask the clerk to please read the roll call. Chairman Rowe. Here. Councillor Backer. Present. Councillor Jordan. Present. Councillor Lennon. Here. Councillor McKinney. Councillor Sherman. Here. And Councillor Swift Kayata. Here. Would you please rise and join me for a Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We now offer our first uh, opportunity for citizens to speak uh, to items that are not on tonight's agenda. No one who would like to speak to items that are not on our agenda this evening. Okay, I would now ask for the town manager's report. We have a pass from the town manager. We need uh, an opportunity for town council reports. And uh, do we have reports from councilors? Ann? Just very briefly, I was in Augusta last Thursday at a meeting of the Legislative Policy Committee of the Maine Municipal Association where we considered uh, a number of important taxation, education, land use, and a variety of other uh, bills that will be before the legislature this session and the Legislative Policy Committee uh, took positions on a number of them that had municipal impacts, most of them having to do with unfunded mandates. So the work continues and the expectation is the legislature will deal with uh, most of those bills by, they weren't <coughs> sure when, hopefully May. So I think the legislature may go a little long this year. Thank you, Ann. Thank you. Other reports from <coughs> councilors? Uh, on March 19th, I had the opportunity to participate uh, along with uh, South Portland uh, Mayor Tom Blake and, and Scarborough Town Manager Tom Allen, uh, Tom Hall, excuse me, uh, to participate in the Local Meals on Wheels program, uh, which is sponsored, sponsored by the Southern Maine Agency on Aging. Uh, I accompanied a driver on the Cape Elizabeth route, and we delivered 14 meals that day. Uh, this was both an, an affirming and an enlightening experience for me and one that I won't uh, soon forget. Uh, for many uh, clients of Meals on Wheels, um, their contract and interaction with the, the deliverer of those meals is their only social uh, interaction during the week. So the program is far more than a meal delivery service. And I came away from that experience uh, feeling very warmly and uh, grateful that we have programs like Meals on Wheels. Other reports? Seeing none. Uh, we will review, have a review of the minutes of the meetings of March 9th, 2009 and March 30th, 2009. Would you like, is it the pleasure of the council to consider those en bloc or individually? Ann? Well, I was unable to be at the March 9th meeting, so I will not be able to vote on the March 9th minutes. So if we could consider them separately, that would okay. be good. Perfect. Very good. Thank you. Uh, the meeting uh, minutes of March 9, please. I have a motion. David? I move the approval of the minutes of our regular meeting dated March 9, 2009. Second. Moved and seconded. Discussion on the motion? David? I have just uh, one comment, I think a, a slight typo with regard to the comments of uh, Ed Matterson toward the top of page two during the discussion of the BA zone amendments. Um, the last part of his comment that's attributed to him is the suggestion that it is fair that other neighborhoods in Cape Elizabeth do not have the same benefit. I think what he said is that it is not fair that other neighborhoods in Cape Elizabeth do not have the same benefit. So just if we can insert the word not, not. before fair. Okay. 
okay with everybody? All in favor of the motion? Show it to be 5-0, please. Uh, the meeting minutes of March 30th. Move to accept. Move to accept. Second. Seconded. Moved and seconded. Discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor of the motion? Unanimous. 6-0, please. Thank you. The uh, first item on tonight's agenda is a public hearing on the proposed fiscal year 2010 general fund and special fund budgets. Um, before uh, we begin the hearing, I would like to uh, just run down the rules quickly uh, so that everybody's on the same page, if you will. This, of course, is a, an important public hearing, and I suspect that there may be one or two citizens who would like to speak uh, uh, and make comments tonight. So. Uh, just bear with me for a minute. The purpose of the hearing is to express views, public views, on the proposed town budgets, all departments, including municipal and school budgets. Uh, if I see that uh, the bully pulpit is being hijacked for some other reason, I'll uh, get us back on, uh, on task. Speakers uh, will address the council from the lectern on the floor to my far left. Uh, speakers will clearly give their names and addresses prior to offering their comments. Comments will be limited to three minutes uh, per speaker. I have uh, what is known affectionately as the Lynch timer here, which will keep this under control. Uh, a respect for the decorum of the meeting should be maintained at all times. There will be no personal attacks allowed against employees, town officials, or others. The audience is cautioned not to offer overt expressions of either pleasure or displeasure. Uh, with comments that have been made, as this can be very intimidating to those who may have a differing opinion. This includes applause, cheering, booing, hissing, or really any openly audible or visible reaction. In the interest of helping the proceedings move as quickly and as efficiently as possible, we ask that speakers uh, line up two or three deep at the lectern. Uh, this should help get, keep things moving. Uh, anyone failing to abide by the rules of the hearing will first be reminded of the rules. Uh, and then if violation uh, continues, they will be asked to leave the premises. Again, respectful comment uh, is the rule of the day, and I, I don't expect problems. Uh, let's fulfill those expectations. Thank you. So I would now declare the public hearing open. Uh, I would like to yield the floor at the beginning of the hearing to the manager who would like to make some comments. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chairman Jim. Actually, David Backer of early today suggested that I might want to do an overview of the dispatcher issue, uh, at least from my perspective, uh, because of you know some of the discussion that's been out there and because some of the points uh, you know coming out in different ways, and it might be best to have a, have a good explanation of it. Uh, first of all, you know, th there's there's been said that the council voted on January in January of 2008 that it would not merge dispatching until. Uh, consolidate dispatch until uh, July 1 of, of 2010. I want to go over specifically uh, what, what, was said that, what was said that night. The vote was that it was the current intent to maintain local dispatching until January 1, uh, until January, excuse me, July 1 of that year, it, uh, upcoming in 2011. It wasn't uh, that there wouldn't be. And so what has changed? You know, what might change the current intent from uh, January 2008. First of all, municipal revenues since then from sources other than the property tax have dropped $512,000. Uh, back then, Portland and South Portland uh, had not decided to try to merge their dispatch operations. And now they have decided that, and they've asked Cape Elizabeth to participate. That free community option was not available back in, in January 2008. Uh, because of the, the option also to look at Cumberland County, uh, Portland, has, who's the leader in this effort, has invited Cape Elizabeth to join the Merge Center at a much lower rate than was anticipated in January 2008. Uh, a grant in the amount of $79,000 received in 2006 from Homeland Security to pay for compatible criminal justice software with South Portland is now subject to a July 1, 2009 expiration date. 
uh, back in early 2008, 2007, 2006, we were looking at a much different arrangement. Those funds were never spent. We weren't sure what we were going to do. But recently, they've said, you have to spend it by this July 1 or you'll lose it. The chief of police, the fire chief, and the town manager all now support the alternative to join forces with the cities of Portland and South Portland. This was not the case in January 2008. Uh, the long-term revenue outlook remains uncertain to the national economy and the state's challenges with revenue forecasting, as we read in the newspaper every day, are, are clearly evident. So, you know, there has been a lot changed without belaboring the national economy. There's a lot that's changed locally in the situation that we're dealing with and facing with, and, and that we're facing other than since January 2008. What effects would the proposed change have in services to be provided to citizens? Our emergency 911 calls have been answered for more than a year by the City of Portland Dispatch Service. The, the calls will continue to be answered by the City of Portland. The change is that the calls will no longer be relayed to Cape Elizabeth, requiring the caller to repeat information. Uh, instead of just one dispatcher on duty uh, serving Cape Elizabeth, a team of dispatchers will be on duty. One dispatcher can handle providing medical information to the caller, while a second dispatcher handles sending personnel and equipment to the scene. During busy times, instead of just one dispatcher uh, being available trying to keep up with multiple calls, again, a team of dispatchers will be available. The software enhancements that are being paid for by the grant uh, provided as part of the merger will give enhanced directions, will have previous call history, and other information to responding police officers and to other public safety personnel thus enabling them to provide better service. The, we, some have sent, said there'll be a delay in response times. Uh, we, we got one email that said EMS wouldn't be in Cape Elizabeth anymore, rescue, and they wanted to know what house that people were responding to, what, what building. The system, uh, there will be no delay in response times. The system we now have of obtaining paramedic intercepts from South Portland will be more seamless. The system we have of sending both South Portland Willard Company and Cape Elizabeth Engine One Company to the same scenes will be more seamless. Mutual aid calls uh, will be more seamless. There's concern that the police station will not have a person at the door except during the day. How will this affect public safety and services? And you know, I've seen numbers, you know, there's 1,500 people that walk into the, the station. Well, about, if we really look at the numbers, about half the visitors to the station during the non-covered hours, during the non-daytime hours, are individuals looking for keys to community service activities, to community service vans, and to Hannaford Field. Community services will be able to change that service by installing card swipe and number keypads at the different facilities, as well as just setting up in advance, getting keys out for their vans. This is, again, about half the, the after-hour calls are the people coming and going to pick up those keys. The police building entry itself will have a camera and a phone tied to the dispatch, the regional dispatch center. The entry area will have a simple keypad with a simple code. There are no known instances of anyone coming to the station in the last 25 years being chased by an individual to the station. There are no known cases in 25 years. Regardless of this lack of history, individuals will be provided access to an area secure from the outside and just as it's now done currently, the dispatcher will call from a, for assistance from an officer. Uh, I'm not providing every detail on how the keypad will work and how simple it will be because for security reasons, we don't want the second person coming in uh, to know those things that they'll hear when they pick up the phone. Uh, is there any change to who is available to respond to calls? No, the same number of police officers are going to be on duty and the fire and rescue services will continue as they are now. We keep hearing that the response will be different, that there won't be people to respond. It's the same response team that we have now actually going to calls. What happens to the current dispatchers? The town has, will have an open position under the proposal for a full-time administrative assistant who will assume the dispatcher's clerical duties at the Cape Elizabeth Police Station. This position will be offered to a dispatcher. There are currently three open positions for dispatchers in Scarborough and in Portland. We have encouraged these departments to consider our personnel. Uh, dispatchers with seniority here in Cape Elizabeth 
may displace employees and other capable of the municipal positions uh, if they qualify for those positions and would provide the police union a list of those positions that, seem, that they seem to be qualified for. Finally, severance packages will be offered to employees who leave as a result of the consolidations and to those who accept a lower paying position with the town. So they'll be covered both ways. Uh, the dispatch was reportedly offered to reopen negotiations. What happened? Uh, the offer from the dispatch would have, would have saved less than 20% of the savings resulting from consolidation. Uh, so there was still 80% of it that was unaccounted for. So what if we wait until 2011, the date that was discussed in January 2008, to consolidate dispatching? First, the town will miss out on approximately $200,000 in savings in the interim and a $79,000 grant to assist with transition, the software grant, uh, will also be foregone. And these numbers assume that the dispatchers will forego their 4% raises for the next two years and offer the other concessions that have been reported that they've given, even though I'm not sure if that those were all fully offered. Uh, second, we are in a very favorable negotiating position right now with the city of Portland. Uh, we have personnel in the city as well as in South Wall and here in Cape Elizabeth committed to working together to make this work. In 2011, we might not be able to obtain terms as favorable as the City of Portland is offering us now, including the currently offered long-term provisions controlling future cost increases. While we don't have a contract or legal agreement yet with the City of Portland, all of the discussions have been that there will be approximately a 3% increase each year beginning at uh, $16 per capita. Uh, so that was concerned with what, when we were looking at the county, what would happen long term at the county. That's not as a concern with the, with the City of Portland agreement. So to conclude, you know, the trend in Maine and elsewhere towards regional consolidation of dispatching is fairly clear. Most small dispatch centers in Maine have already consolidated into larger units. Even Portland and South Portland do not see themselves as individually being large enough not to coordinate the dispatch function. The proposed change in dispatching is about 33% of the total needed in adjustments in this year's municipal budget in order to avoid a second year in a row of a large increase in taxes for municipal services. <clears throat> in recent years, we hear over and over, we need to be efficient, we need to watch tax dollars closely, the municipal budget should receive the same scrutiny as the school budget. We need to work, with, and also we need to work with surrounding communities to discuss opportunities for regional cooperation and possible expenditure savings. For all these reasons I have stated with all this background, the Chiefs and I believe that the proposal to consolidate this dispatching with Portland and South Portland will lead to better, more efficient service. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Mike. Uh, obviously, Mike went over his three minutes, uh, but we did feel that it was important to, uh, to give the background of the issue. So. Uh, I will now officially open the public hearing uh, to citizens to speak. Can I just go ahead? Yeah. Please give your name and address. Okay. Uh, my name is Randy Ballenbach, and I live at 51 Belfield Road. I would like to voice my opinion about the budget, and in particular about the school budget. I'm a fiscal conservative. As such, I generally favor lower taxes. Like many people, and probably like many fiscal conservatives, the filter I use to judge most issues is economics. As a fiscal conservative, I think it's critical for CAPE to maintain a strong school system, including supporting the schools financially. Our property taxes are tied to the strength of our schools. If the quality of our schools is reduced, our property values will also be reduced. For me, this is not an emotional argument. It's just simply economic logic. My child, who is right now a sophomore, will soon be graduating, but even after he leaves the Cape Elizabeth school system, I would support the schools economically, frankly, because it's just in my best interest to do so. I recently had a conversation with a very fiscally conservative friend who lives in Hanover, New Hampshire. Hanover is somewhat similar to Cape in that the public schools are good and certainly have a good reputation. People moving to the area pay a premium to live in Hanover because of the school system. I happened to ask this friend if there was much dispute about the school budget in his town and how he personally felt about the school budget. He gave me an odd stare as if I were asking sort of an irrational question and said with virtually no wasted words, 
In our town, everybody supports the school budget because of property values. There's no debate. Everybody gets it. They go, they vote, and that's it. I can't tell you how strongly I agree with this statement um, in a very rational, non-emotional, but strong fashion as one who's concerned about maintaining my property values in Cape Elizabeth. I hope you will consider this point as you evaluate the budget for this coming fiscal year. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Ellen Anna. Um, I have been a lifelong resident of Cape Elizabeth uh, with the exception of 12 years. Uh, as a young girl in elementary school, they drilled into our head the emergency number. 79985811. I cannot tell you how many times we heard that number in school. In January of 2006, I was attacked in my home by a knife. And I had to use that number. And that's the number that came to my mind, not 911. And Cape Elizabeth picked up. And they answered the call and they were at my home within minutes. The person who attacked me was let out on bail. And approximately a month later, attacked me yet again with my four-year-old and five-year-old in my car as I pulled into my garage. I was fortunate enough to have OnStar in my car, and when I was able to, I used that. At that particular moment, trying to explain why I needed to speak to the Cape Elizabeth police was not on my mind. Within moments, I don't know what OnStar said to the Cape Elizabeth dispatch, but I know I heard Ed Hunt's voice, and he said to me, Ellen, it's Ed. What happened? What do you need? So you talk about, we don't live in Portland, we don't live in South Portland for a reason. With all due respect, in this town, what is more important, peace of mind or money? And I will tell you personally, as someone who never thought that I would need that, it is very comforting to have that response. He knew my story, he knew what had happened, and he responded. I had screaming children in the back, I had two older children in danger in a school. Within moments, they had the police in action to remove the older two from the school and to deal with us. I had police cars driving by me before I got within two miles of my home. It is a mistake, a very grave mistake, to give up the dispatch in this town, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. I'm sure it's going to be tough eating that one. <clears throat> my name is Waldeck Mainville. I live 129 Merrimack Place in the Hobstone Condominium Complex off of Mitchell Road. I'm going to read a statement that I prepared earlier. There are 8,825 citizens of Cape Elizabeth presently served 24-7 by one of our four local dispatchers. One could argue statistically then that the average number of citizens being served is 8,825 per dispatcher. South Portland has five dispatchers serving a population of 23,300. If you add in the population of Portland, which is 64,000, the combined populations total 96,125. Statistically, if dispatch is consolidated, <coughs> the average number of citizens being served by these five dispatchers is 19,225 per dispatcher. Is it any wonder that some of the South Portland dispatchers are not in favor of consolidation. Neither am I. I'm recommending to the council that they honor their January 2008 commitment to maintain local dispatch until 2011. I think the town manager has made a hasty choice to close local dispatch 77 days from now. <clears throat> With few details of a consolidation plan established and little input from concerned town citizens, who are not on the town payroll and directly under the town manager's grip. The suggestion to close local dispatch, hire a daytime secretary, and close the station to the public from 4 p.m. until 8 a.m. is particularly alarming. There are about 1,500 walk-ins annually 
during the same time period, where will they start to go July 1st? Is this loss of security to each of our 800, I'm sorry, 8,825 citizens, saving each about $14 annually, well thought out? Public meetings, letters to counselors, letters to editors of local papers, emails, blogs, and many hundred conversations with town folks have convinced me that there's great concern on this issue and many have provided alternate ways to save money in lieu of closing local dispatch. Have any of these suggestions been seriously considered in the last few weeks? We are, why aren't we emulating some of our neighbors' cost-saving measures? Closing local dispatch is not a good thing at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Dick. We'll mix it up a little bit and talk about schools. Um, I'm Frank Gavernale. I'm from uh, Old Ocean House Road. I'll read my, my uh, comments to stick within the three minute a lot of time. <clears throat> uh, basically, the debate on the town budget now seems to be whether or not we should have a 0% increase or no increase or a 0.6% increase, uh, and that all comes down to what the uh, school budget will be. And it seems to me that this uh, debate is really more about emotions and ideology than it's about hard facts and fiscal responsibility. The bottom line is we need to do what's right for the entire town, not just for the school children and parents, and not just for the fixed income residents who may be having a hard time and who have no kids in the schools. And the right thing at this point is to approve the school board, the school board recommended budget. And importantly, we can do this while not ignoring the needs of our neighbors. For residents struggling to make ends meet, there are a variety of safety net options that can cover the $27 increase that median priced, a median priced homeowner will face with a 0.6% increase. There are at least three different mechanisms by which residents can receive tax relief and other forms of financial assistance. First is the state circuit breaker program. In 2008, 20% of CAPE households received some level of tax relief through the state circuit breaker provision. 710 people received tax refunds averaging $780 per person. In addition, 68 people received rent refunds. This program is available to all residents based on their income. Second, there's the Thomas Jordan Trust, which is available to help struggling households. As of the last meeting of, the, of its board, the trust had assets of $783,000 with income targeted to help people make ends meet. Last fall, approximately $36,000 of funds were approved for community services scholarships. Third, the Jordan Trust allocated funds to the town last year to pay a social worker from the People's Regional Opportunity Program, PROP, to help residents file for needed assistance in the various programs that are already available from the state and regional bodies. This service is still available to all residents in need of financial assistance. So while I don't want to diminish the impact of this treacherous economy on our community, it's important that everyone take advantage of help that's already available and to recognize that as a community, we have the ability to both help our neighbors as well as adequately fund our schools. These two goals are not mutually exclusive. Keeping our schools strong and competitive is necessary in order to provide a good education for our kids and support the property values of our homes. And in this period of financial stress, there is nothing more important to supporting property values than supporting the schools. Just as you want to keep your home in tip-top shape to retain its value in tough markets, you need to do the same for the schools. For this reason, I think it's necessary for the future of Cape Elizabeth and all of its residents to approve the school budget proposal and which would lead to a 6.6% property tax increase for the town. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. My name is Helen Mainville and I live at 29 Merrimack Place in Cape Elizabeth. Uh, first, before you start the clock, I would like to just address the um, the managers, when he was given some of the background, uh, he mentioned that it was the, the vote of 2008 was only supposed to reflect the current intent. Is that correct? The, That's correct. Of the, um, when I look at the documents on the town's website, it, it specifically says that the um, council voted unanimously to affirm their commitment to keeping dispatch in town until July of 2011. Um, and even if that was, there hasn't been a meeting since then to change their current intent that I know of. 
at least there's no documents to support that. So I'm not sure that, that it, it's still current, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. The $79,000 grant, why can't we use that anyway? I mean, whether we consolidate or don't consolidate, we could still use the grant and put the whatever equipment it is, the software enhancements, into the hands of the police department and into their cars so that they can go ahead and use it. I don't think we should just let that fly away. Anyway, um, I am here this evening to speak, obviously, on behalf of keeping our dispatch center open and in town, and I thank the council for the opportunity to speak. It was reported in the local newspaper that the fire chief and the police chief appeared before the finance committee and sang praises in favor of consolidation. The town manager appoints all department heads in the town. Is it any wonder why the chiefs would support the manager's proposal to consolidate dispatch? There are over 100 volunteers connected with emergency services in Cape Elizabeth. There are five companies, two fire, one rescue, a wet team, and fire police, under the supervision of the fire chief. I am one of those volunteers and can assure you that the chief does not speak for me on this issue and in fact does not speak for any of the volunteers. If he intimated to the counselors at the finance committee that he was speaking for all of us, then I'm afraid you were misled. In fact, two of the companies passed a motion unanimously in support of retaining a local dispatch center um, and the dispatchers. In January of 2008, five of the seven counselors here tonight voted unanimously to affirm its commitment to having a local dispatch center through July 1 of 2011. Over the last seven days, a group of citizens has collected over 640 signatures from concerned taxpayers and voters on a petition that respectfully requests that the town council honor their commitment of January 2008. There needs to be more planning on the part of the town before we eliminate dispatch. What harm is there in waiting until July of 2011 and using that time from now till then to come up with a solid plan that can be fully explained to the people and be seamless in its execution? The public may even offer less resistance on the issue. Why don't we wait until July 2011 and let other communities consolidate and see how it works for them first and then decide if it will at all even work for us? Is it really prudent for us to just jump in now and be one of the guinea pig consolidation people? Don't we think that we can gain more perspective by waiting two years and two months? Have maybe a better plan in place? I don't understand what the hurry is. Simply put, could you just honor your promise of January 2008 show the citizens of Cape Elizabeth that you do value their input as you asked and that you have listened to our concerns. Thank you, and I'll give you these signatures. Thank you. Hello. My name is Mark Sikowski. I live at 29 Ocean View Road. And I came tonight specifically to support the school budget proposal, which would increase our taxes by 0.6%. Um, many of you know me. I'm in the healthcare industry. Most of my professional day is centered around informing patients of risk versus benefit to the decisions they make about their personal health and their well-being. I would submit that you all, over the next several weeks, have a similar decision to make. By making a decision to not support the school budget as proposed, may carry a short-term benefit of taking a politically expedient way out and saying a 0% increase. But I would submit that the risk is far greater to the repercussions that we've suffered. Our schools have been cut consistently. We have lost teacher positions. We have lost ed tech positions. We have lost extracurricular programs that are being funded by parents. We have lost morale, and we've lost the core essence of our town, which is our schools. It's my honest and sincere belief that we are not coasting on reputation, and the problems that we are going to be encountering in the next several years, as Ms. Bolenbach alluded to, are only going to hurt our property values. And more importantly, they're going to hurt our children. I believe that we have the real potential of becoming a town where we send our kids, we send our kids to elementary school but then find a private school to send them to, which serves no one well and doesn't help anyone. I would ask you to not follow political dogma of a 0% increase. I have yet to hear from a group that supports zero increase where they would cut further in the schools. I have not heard one real proposal that shows where in the school budget there is fat. I assure you there is none. 
I'm asking you to please make a very difficult decision that may not be popular with a large portion of the town. But our children and our town will all benefit from supporting the current school budget. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Good evening. Mary Ann Dennison, 1169 Soy Road. I'm here tonight for two reasons. The first reason is this public hearing process. My husband has lived in Cape Elizabeth his entire life, and I'm an outsider because I've only been here 22 years. For the past 18 years, we've been busy raising our children, working, and volunteering in this community. Many times we've sat at home and watched the town council meetings and wondered why there aren't more residents here. I'm glad to see a lot here tonight. Maybe now I know the answer. In January, the issue of outsourcing the public safety dispatch service was in the headlines. We are both surprised, as it was only a previous year, that the council voted on the resolution that would keep the center in town until at least 2011. I decided I couldn't sit at home this time. So I attended the public hearing on January 21st. Please know that standing up here is very intimidating. But I felt very passionate about keeping the service in town. Much to my surprise, two days later, I was informed that after that meeting, I was like a troublemaker. I had many emotions, surprised because I was very respectful up here, disappointed, very disappointed in the process, and very anger, angry. Residents should feel that they can express their opinions without being fear of being blackballed in this town. I would request that after this budget process is complete, the town council address the issue of public hearings. Are you doing it only for illegal obligations, or do you really care about the residents' opinions? The main reason I'm here tonight is to ask the council members that voted for the resolution to keep the dispatch center in town to honor their vote. I really didn't know where this fit in, but I, in all my researching, I came across an article from the town website. It mentions in the article that by, and I'm going to quote, affirming the town's intent, intent to continue with local dispatching for now could help retain employees, end of quotations. How ironic those same employees are now being laid off. Councilor Swift Kayetta, Councilor Backer, Councilor Lennon, and Councilor McKinney, who is absent tonight, obviously, you all voted yes to accept this resolution on January 15, 2008. I ask you tonight to reaffirm your vote by voting no on this proposed budget. Chairman Rowe, I want to thank you for being man of your word from the very beginning of this issue, you have stated your word is worth more than the stated savings, and you would stand by your vote, so thank you. I only hope your fellow council members will follow your example. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. My name is Boyce Sanborn, and I own property 600 Thrush Road in Cape Elizabeth. I'm here to speak to you about the police and fire dispatch I strongly support maintaining that service. I think it would be a tragedy to this community to lose it. I think that you have some financial issues to discuss, and as a council, I think that you need to do it in cooperation with the manager. I think to just eliminate that is too much, too soon, and I think it would be a detriment to this community. I worked in this community for years. I lived in this community for years. And my mother did as well. I remember my mother having a fire a few years ago. And the police and fire responded. They saved the house and they tracked me down to assist her. She was 92. Later on, you have a policy here where your police and fire are calling the shut-ins. And they did call. And they found that she didn't sound like she was speaking to the woman. And they sent the rescue. And it's what saved her life. You may disagree, but the hospital said that it was those calls and that follow-up that saved her life. And they tracked me down again. And you're not going to get this service from Poland or South Poland. I spent 30 years in law enforcement, 27 of them with South Poland. I think they do a great job. They haven't got the time to provide the service that your police and fire dispatchers do. I ask you for the benefit of your shut-ins and for your elderly, continue. 
we're talking about the monies that you're going to save, and I listen to the manager, and I have no intentions of attacking the manager or the police and fire representatives here. They're all fine people. They all have a job to do. Your police and fire chiefs, good soldiers. Your manager is a good manager. He's talking dollars and cents. I'm talking about lives and security. I disagree that there's never been a domestic abuse, a person threatened domestically where they had to run. I didn't spend the years I did here not to know that took place. I know that Alice Lothrop was murdered years ago and we've never solved that murder. I gotta be getting close to my three minutes and so Bowen I have five. <laughs> <laughs> I believe I owe this community. My mother lived because of the fire and police dispatch, because of your rescue, because of your procedures. She lived until she was 95. For that, I thank you. And for that, I will promise you right now, you keep police and fire, I'll offer you a measly $500 this year towards maintaining police and fire dispatch. I will offer it for every year that I'm alive, and I'm pushing 60. I'll never see my mother's 95, but I'll give it to you 500 every year for every year that you protect these people and everyone that lives in this community. Please don't be short-sighted. Figures can be misunderstood. Don't misunderstand them. And for financial scrutiny and lose the quality of life that you have. And Penny, you know where I live, call me. Jim, you know where I live. Mr. Becker, thank you for calling me back. I beg you, save what you've got. It's a quality of life. Thank you. Thank you, boys. Hi, my name's Laurel Grasson Drake. I live at 9 Wainwright Drive. There are two things I want to address. The first is the use of contingency funds to go to the school board for a planned future budget, which is completely inappropriate use of contingency funds, and which probably is something that most of the people here don't understand what's happening. It's very confusing. It's not clear on the website, and I don't think it's clear to the public. I've been on the board of various nonprofits. Contingency funds typically have two purposes. Potential revenue purpose is for use for emergencies that happen during a already budgeted year, that you're in the process of, something comes up that you didn't budget, and you need those monies for that. The other, as reserves, is to be to um, be used for a cash flow mis mismatch, where your funds coming in do not equal um, the funds that you need to put out. Say you've got payments to be made to public services or various salaries, and for whatever reason, um, taxes you've expected in aren't coming in on time. It's to do that without having to go to some kind of public financing. It is not for a planned budget. It was one thing to switch contingency funds in the current fiscal year when there was a fall through of the state funding. But to actually plan to use contingency funds is irresponsible. They are emergency funds. They are not savings. That it is a, the amount we have as contingency funds, as I understand it, is what's recommended for a town or a school budget of our size. We will have to replace those funds. They are not a savings. And to say that they are a savings in the current budget year that we're doing is misleading. If, if we were actually using or having to replace those contingency funds, I believe, as I said, it's hard to tell from what's on the website, but the increased property taxes would be closer to 2% than 0.6%. I know there's 200,000 from the town budget being from the town reserves, not budget, that's the problem, being moved over, and I believe there's 70,000 from the school reserves. I'm not sure about that because it's not clear. But 
I think people should be aware that these are funds that are supposed to be emergency funds in an existing budget year, not something for future planning, and that they have to be replaced. They aren't just money coming out of nowhere. That's my first point. The second is just briefly on the schools. From the time I've arrived here, there has been a flow, yes. I'm All right, closing I'm sorry. A flow of information that implies that more money equals better schools and better education requires more money. This is not a tautology. And at our level of spending, we have no evidence this is true. There's not been huge cuts. We haven't had any serious decline me, in any scores. I have to ask you. All right. Yeah. Thank, I'll you. Thank you very much. Good evening. My name is Paul Gaspar. Uh, I'm a resident of South Portland, but I'm here this evening in my capacity as the executive director of the Maine Association of Police. Uh, the Maine Association of Police is the registered bargaining agent for the Cape Elizabeth Police Benevolent Association, uh, including that of the dispatchers. Uh, many times when I come to these types of events, uh, many people have that first fear that we're going to kind of decry that the sky will fall and the earth will open uh, if you should choose to consolidate. I'm not here to do that. Uh, but in my official capacity and, and what I've known, both as serving as a police officer here in the town of Cape Elizabeth for 10 years, uh, and in five years traveling throughout the state, uh, working with municipal police officers and dispatchers, uh, I can tell you quite safely, the sky will not fall and the ground will not open and swallow us up if we do not have a local dispatch. But what I can promise you is that the level of service and the change in service will be immediate and tangible. And how do I know that? I know that from talking to, to many people, as Manager McGovern has, I'm sure, uh, both from the administrative side as well as the line side. Uh, as Mr. Sanborn quite aptly said, uh, as an administrator, you certainly are imbued with the responsibilities of not only running uh, a municipal entity, but also uh, providing for its financial welfare in the overall budget. Uh, in addition to that, if you go across the aisle, and speak with the line officers and dispatchers, those who are on the line uh, in the after hours when administrators have gone home, they will tell you a completely different story, that there is a, a decrease in service, there is a concern for officer safety, and that immediate tie to a local dispatch is very, very important. I spent the day in Augusta today under the moldy dome, and every time I'm there, I'm, I'm awed by the government that goes on there. But I also come to the fundamental reasoning that our elected officials are imbued to be the stewards of our taxpayers. And I know that times are tough and people are making very tough choices as taxpayers, getting by as workers, what have you. Uh, but I have to think that in realizing that, in realizing that level of service, uh, there are some things that are very difficult to put that price on. Uh, what I would ask is that you seriously consider keeping dispatch local. I, I am in a little bit of deferment with the manager in as much as having been through several of these from Camden to Gorham to Yarmouth and Freeport. When you talk about regionalization, what you're actually talking about is growing bureaucracy. And if anything is taught is when you grow bureaucracy, the level of service goes down. And much time is wasted and spent on running the bureaucracy and not the service. What I would add uh, to that is that being the stewards of the taxpayers of Cape Elizabeth, please seriously consider uh, the level of service that has been uh, anecdotally told to you tonight and from my personal experience uh, as well. Uh, I think it would serve you well. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Paul. Hi, I'm Suzanne McGann, 1180 Shore Road. I'm here to talk about the school budget. I'm going to start off with a quote. The future belongs to the nation that best educates its citizens. We have everything we need to be that nation. It is time to give all Americans a complete and competitive education from the cradle up through a career. We have accepted failure for too long. America's entire education system must once more be the envy of the world. Despite resources that are unmatched anywhere in the world, we have let our grades slip, our schools crumble, our teacher quality falls short, and other nations outpace us. The relative decline of American education 
is untenable for our economy, unsustainable for our democracy, and unacceptable for our children. We cannot afford to let it continue. These are the words of President Obama. According to the 2007 National Academies report, rising above the gathering storm, there is a critical lack of technically trained people in the U.S. that can be traced directly to poor K through 12 math and science instruction. This is especially true in Maine, where it is known that employers cannot find an adequately trained technical workforce. Maine employers hire from out of state as well as foreign nationals. In 2003, the Program of International Student Assessment found that U.S. 15-year-olds ranked 28th out of 40 countries in mathematics and 19th out of 40 countries in science. If the United States is to compete successfully in the 21st century, our students must have the motivation to become the next generation of scientists and engineers who can address the national problems of homeland security, health care, the provision of energy, the preservation of the environment, and the growth of the economy, including the creation of jobs. Research confirms that teachers are crucially important to students' success, yet such, such subjects, areas as math, science, and foreign languages suffer severe long-term teacher shortages. Few would dispute that the very large salary differential between teaching and private sector work in these fields and perceptions of teaching as a low-status profession dissuade talented and committed individuals from entering or remaining in the teaching profession. Therefore, our mandate should be to recruit, educate, and retain excellent K-12 teachers who fundamentally understand biology, chemistry, physics, engineering, and mathematics. We need to transform the teaching profession by ensuring that it offers high quality opportunities for professional growth and career development. We must acknowledge and respect the professional knowledge and skills that those educators bring to their jobs and we must pay them accordingly. One of Obama's main crusades is the education, is the education arena is increasing teacher salaries. I don't want to just talk about how great teachers are, I want to reward them for their greatness, quote unquote. Despite the current global recession, the Obama administration has recognized that a far-reaching overhaul of the nation's education system is an economic imperative that can't wait, despite the urgency of the financial crisis and other pressing issues. The proposed school budget is addressing this imperative as best it can, given the years of arbitrary caps imposed upon it. Excuse me. It takes, last sentence, it takes a community to raise a child, and this community should support its schools and educators. Thank you. Thank you very much. Susan, could you give us your last name? I'm sorry, I didn't. McGinn, M-C-G-I-N-N. Thank, Thank you. Good evening. Uh, Bill DeSena, 11 Wainwright Drive. I am uh, the lightning rod, I guess, for a group called Cape for All. And uh, we are a group of uh, uh, professional people with the uh, goals of excellence in education, fiscal prudence, as well as transparent government. We have a, a very large contingency of academia in our midst, and we've used them to spend the last six months attending all of the meetings, workshops, talking to a number of um, educated uh, well, in the educational system from the board down as well as on the town side, trying to understand the process. Uh, we fully agree with everyone in this community that our number one goal is to have great academic uh, achievements for our kids. And we support that theory because it affects all property values. I think where we uh, differ is how you get there and uh, hopefully some of the speakers tonight will shed a little light on what we have done was to look at the past, try to assess uh, what we've been doing and where we're going. Uh, some people think throwing money at it is the answer and uh, we happen to come from a different school and believe that it's really in the curriculum and a well-managed curriculum, good teachers, uh, we support paying them more, certain ones, and others uh, retraining or uh, finding another career for them. Uh, we uh, definitely have noted uh, uh, high budgets every year. They have outpaced the CPI. Um, 
We've gone only back to 2000, but there's no need to go further, and we've taken it a national. We've even compared it to the main CPI, and essentially our school budget cumulatively has doubled both of those. So the argument that have been used, there's a lot of rhetoric going on, and we're just trying to establish some facts that will give us a starting point to move forward smartly and more efficiently so that we can deploy the tools and resources and achieve the end desire we all have. Um, we've even gone to the point of submitting some out-of-the-box ideas to the board, and of course, as stewards of our uh, tax dollars, that's their decision whether they are haywire or worth something. Um, I think in wrapping up my part of it, I just want to tell you that I don't think there's anyone here who disputes the um, fact that we're all in this thing together and we should be pulling together and we've got to be spreading the pain amongst everyone here. We can't be dismissing some people and enriching other people. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. I'm Tom Dunham. <clears throat> I live at 11 Becky's Cove Lane. Um, I'm not very <clears throat> I'm well uncomfortable um, in public speaking, but uh, I will begin. Uh, let us all recognize and take responsibility to mitigate the financial pain <coughs> of your neighbors. No one has escaped this economic crisis. Local job losses in the area are real and deep. Just over the past three months, <clears throat> after the school board stated budget goal of 2% increase, the following local companies have either terminated or furloughed employees. Many are living in Cape Elizabeth. Uh, just <clears throat> to list a few, it's L.O. Beans, Fairchild and National Semiconductor, Wood Structures, Bath Ironworks, Retail Stores, Credit Unions, Law Firms, um, Area Municipal and School Departments, Earth Contractors, and Building Trades. No business or institution is escaping this extended recession. As a community, we must pull together, make the prudent structural and long-term decisions to reduce both the school and municipal expenditures. Early on, Mike McGovern and, <clears throat> and his staff and the counselors took the lead by achieving a zero budget increase. Not an easy task, but achievable and laudable. Unfortunately, the municipal budget is only 30% of the town budget. 70% of the costs are schools, of which 80% are teachers, administration and staff salaries, which increased 5.4% this coming year, or 700, over $721,000. Plus, the following year in 2011 is another 5.4 percent. This plus the taxpayers are paying 88 percent of the health care benefits, not just for the employee, but for their entire family. If health care costs increase 10 percent annually, that will add about $300,000 a year to the school budget, and certainly they're going to go up. In these difficult times, I recommend that <coughs> these salary increases be deferred or cut. As you will learn, we are on a <clears throat> school spending course that cannot be sustained. Best to deal with it today than massive restructuring and layoffs in 12 to 18 months as this faltering economy continues for several years. We need a three-year budget plan for both the municipal side as well as the schools. Given the harsh financial reality of today, we must achieve a zero tax impact or less for fiscal 2010. Let us see that we accomplish this together and have it approved in May so our collective energies are spent improving the Cape Elizabeth School curriculum, which will enable students to better prepare to compete in this global economy. One of the out-of-the-box ideas, and I don't think it's that far-fetched, is to consolidate the administration in K through 8. We figure that's an easy savings of four to five hundred thousand dollars. Um, and we've also um, have spoken to the Department of Education in Augusta, and they fully support that direction. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is uh, Tom Kinley, and I live at 1159 Shore Road. And I'd just like to uh, take a few minutes to uh, talk to you about the school budget, which I believe should be uh, a zero increase instead of the 1.9% that I believe is being proposed for the school budget. It's interesting when you look back at 2000, where we had a $12,762,000 or $12,762,000 
budget and we had 1,743 students in the school with 143 uh, full-time equivalent teachers at a cost of about $7,322. Today we're looking at a school budget of around 19 million with uh, 1,748 students estimated for 2009 at a cost of $11,320 per student. A pretty large increase. I think Tom uh, Dunham covered uh, some of the issues that I have uh, uh, with the school budget going forward. When you look at the base pay increases that the teachers are going to receive uh, this year of 3.9 percent, and I, I realize that these are union contracts that you're talking about, and then if you take into consideration the step-ups that each teacher gets, you're looking at 5.4 percent increase in salaries in a year when most people are uh, looking for jobs and barely uh, getting by, and most corporations aren't even considering uh, increasing salaries uh, for employees in this economy. And then you look at the benefit. Now I know that uh, back in the old days uh, we looked at uh, benefits as being something that teachers got because we weren't able to pay them quite as much as everybody else gets. But nowadays, you know, their pay is getting up there and their benefits outstrip anything in the uh, private sector when you're paying 88% uh, of the uh, health care uh, for the teachers across the board, whether it's a family plan or an individual plan. Most corporations are barely, uh, are barely paying 50% of the family plan, and most of them are paying somewhere as around 90%. Uh, for the individual plan. And so I think, you know, I talked to you back in January, and I think it's time that we look at this thing and start restructuring ourselves in an economy where the dollars aren't going to be there going forward, and the students are going down, not up, and yet we're keep continuing to have 160 uh, teacher equivalents in our school. Somebody said earlier that the teachers are going down. The evidence doesn't back that up. The evidence says there's less te students and the same number of teachers when we were at a peak of over 1,890 students. So I just think that uh, it's time to send this budget back to the school uh, board and tell them to come back uh, with a zero uh, increase. Uh, I have to tell you, I wish I could have gone uh, to my employees with a zero increase in expenses, but we had a reduction of 5% across the board, and I think most corporations have. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Tom. Hi, my name is Barbara Dunham, and I live at 30 Ocean View Road. And I've been trying since January to figure out the school budget. And I'm trying to figure out the work that is done in order for there to be student learning. I would like, I would request the superintendent to please um, categorize the work. Counseling, instruction of students, staff development, administering team meetings, administering IEP meetings, taking care of IEP paperwork, and there are many other categories of work. And I would like to see how much time is spent and how much that work costs, always keeping our eye on the prize, which is increased student learning. We are all referring to the school budget tonight. Frankly, it's not clear what it is. Please clarify it. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Hi, I'm Ruth Ann Haley. I live at 49 Brentwood Road. I moved to Cape Elizabeth two years ago um, from Massachusetts where I resigned as a member of the school board. I was in my second term, chair of the policy committee. Uh, I sat on the curriculum committee and the athletic task force. In my former district, we had 3,600 students, seven buildings, and operated on $22 million. And we managed to send our students to very fine schools. I do understand a budget and the obligation of the board. My biggest concern is the allocation of $20 million that affects direct services to students. In a meeting I had with the superintendent, he shared his concerns with me 
about the need to meet the, meet the needs of the average student, the student in the middle. 20% of our students in Cape Elizabeth start school a year later than the traditional age, which is a great advantage for those students in athletics and academics, but creates classrooms with a wider spectrum of abilities than what we would have in classrooms if students were of appropriate age. We might consider accelerating these particularly advanced students who are also age appropriate for a grade level above. The superintendent also shared his concerns from a NEASC report in 2006 where they were concerned about assessment in curriculum and instruction. I think those concerns continue today. In math, for example, according to the CEIF website, 45% of the second graders went to the math lab for extra help in telling time. In my mind, if 45% of the students in the school in the second grade need help, there's something wrong in the classroom. In my former district, we piloted five different math programs and found that the spiral math, like the Chicago math you use here, was the least effective for the majority of students. It was very expensive to run and did not have diversity of delivery. The problems math continue here in the middle school, where once again CEF helps out with $99,000 grant for three years to develop curriculum, research, and help struggling students. This is according to their website, where 20% of the students in middle school struggle with the Chicago math that you use here. Math is critical for everyone, and I hope assessment will change the delivery here and the curriculum so that all students are reached, particularly those average students in the middle who seem to be missed and who, for whom this superintendent is very concerned. We should work at a variety of levels and learning styles. The reading has the same concerns, multiple levels of help outside the classroom, which is very expensive. Can I just close with a personal note? I know that you're very interested in having excellent schools here, one of the best in the country, as the website states. My daughter teaches in one of the best public schools of the country, in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. They have 12,000 students, and they share a German teacher, double up on Latin I and Latin II, and she is a coach and drives the team bus. We might take a lesson from them. Thank you. Thank you, Ruthanne. Hello. <clears throat> uh, my name is Sandy Dunham, and I live at 11 Becky's Cove Lane. Uh, my husband, Tom, and I have been residents of Cape Elizabeth since 1979. We have two children who attended Cape Elizabeth schools, and I'd like to tell you about our daughter, Ashley, who was one of the children in the middle that Ruthann just referred to. On her fourth grade assessment, she scored in the 99th percentile in math, but was at the bottom in language arts. At that time, whole language and inventive spelling <clears throat> were the cutting edge curriculum used in Cape Elizabeth schools. Unfortunately, our daughter needed a phonics, uh, phonics-based language program, which was not offered at that time, and she didn't really overcome um, the detrimental effects of the inventive spelling until she was in high school. By fifth grade, Ashley had given up on trying to be a good student, believing that she couldn't succeed no matter how hard she tried. Her teacher told us um, that she was an average C student, so we really shouldn't worry, and besides, he didn't have time to give her any special attention in the classroom. We were told by the school officials, sorry, guess she just uh, fell through the cracks, so we can't do anything about that. At that point, we sent Ashley to a tutor who worked uh, with her, and she began having uh, success in the classroom. On the advice of the tutor, we enrolled her in North Yarmouth Academy, where she worked really hard and excelled, not as an average C student, but as an honor student. She graduated from Bates College and is currently finishing up a second bachelor's degree with a four-point grade point average at Simmons College. She's applied for graduate school and plans to start a program uh, in the fall. Unfortunately, Ashley's experience in Cape Elizabeth is not unique. I've talked to other parents of past and current students whose children have had the same educational experience as our daughter. 
and it saddens me that there are still many children in the middle in Cape Elizabeth schools whose self-esteem is being diminished when they are pulled out of class for remedial math and language arts. These children have great potential, as evidenced by our daughter, whom the Cape schools had given up on by the time she was in the fifth grade. Since the budget has gone up every year and the problems still exist, maybe it isn't all about spending more money. I commend Mike McGovern and the Town Council for presenting a budget that will not raise property taxes, and I urge the Town Council to adopt a 0% uh, school budget. I also agree with Ruth Ann that the superintendent and the school board should focus on reviewing the curriculum and coming up with a real plan with measurable goals that we can afford that will help all the students in the Cape schools reach their greatest potential. This work should be finished by no later than the end of 2009. With hard work and determination, we can achieve excellence for every Cape Elizabeth student. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, before my three minutes start, could I ask that this chart be taken down? Because, quite frankly, it's, I don't agree with anything on it or its relevance, but it's certainly not what I want to say. Is the Cape for All group uh, done with their organizing presentations? If they are, yes, I, I would take that down, please. Could, could I have a member? I take it down, but I'm afraid Tom might bring my own. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's accurate. <laughs> Um, I actually wasn't going to speak tonight. I was at home helping my son with his homework, but I just obviously can't resist opening my mouth, so I'm here. Um, I don't have a lot to say. I, I spent most of my time on the school budget making recommendations of where they could, might be able to save money, where I think they should spend money. Uh, quite frankly, um, I listened to the Cape for All people, and I heard nothing but suggestions. Let's make it a zero budget. And quite frankly, I don't know how that's possible if we want to give a quality education. What I really want to do is say two things. One, I think the town council and the school board has done an excellent job. I really think you'd be commended. To come to um, a zero budget and then get hit from behind by a half a million dollar sandbag by the state of Maine and then sit together and work as one cape, not municipal versus town, as the, school, as the town council did and come up with a rearranging system only about a 0.6% increase, I think is amazing. And I think it shows what we're supposed to be as a town. We work together, we have a problem, we solve it. Um, and I want to tell you, I think it took political courage, and I want to commend both the town council and the school board for doing what um, I might not agree with in terms of the spending, but I think it showed heart and courage in, in this time. We've got a much bigger train coming down the track. Uh, as you probably know, the, the state of Maine is going to whack us again next year by at least another half a million to a million. And that has to be made up by us. I'd love to, to volunteer to sue the state of Maine, but um, we, we have much more problems coming down the road. I think you people have bought us time. And I think we have to spend that time next year wisely, not worrying about pennies, not worrying about some hidden inefficiency, but we have real big dollars we have to deal with. And I think your conduct, you the town council and the school board and Mike and Alan showed the kind of working together that we need for the next year if we're gonna make it. It's a real big train and it's gonna flatten us unless we do it. And I want to thank all of you. Thank you, David. Good evening. <clears throat> My name is Carl Pearson, and I live in a house adjacent to the road Fowler. And I have the dubious distinction of being the town's most prolific web prowler. <clears throat> I just want to apologize, too, to anyone in advance if I've offended you in any of my writings. It was not my intent. My dad has always told me to subdue my passions when I go and uh, discuss something, and usually what I do with my passions is I turn to poetry. Uh, and I understand that according to the town manager with technology and our ability to record what's said and discuss and everything, 10 years from now what we say might sound kind of silly. But I've started this written three minute speech no less than a dozen times. Originally I decided I wanted it to read in perfect rhymes. But each time I tried to make all the words and thoughts fit, I ended up hitting delete and screaming, shoulda, coulda, woulda. <laughs> If there were more facts and figures to present, what's equitable and fair and stood the test of reason. But I'd need at least another season. And then I thought, what's wrong with that suggestion? It would allow for proper public digestion. 
Why not keep the dispatching local until the promised date of 2011 and work out a compromise that is agreeable to all these new seven? Counselors and manager, along with department heads too, dispatchers, firefighters, wet team, rescue, fire police, and all of you. Together we could see if it will still had to be a regional service with the South Portland, Portland community. We could install the computers in our police cars now and work on the systems which are, at the very least would allow the participants a real chance to learn and understand it all and upon its own merit to rise and fall. With a proper plan in place preventing performance that's poor, we could experience a transition with which we could ensure. The same levels of services are enhanced as has been professed and we won't be shaking our heads saying we messed the whole system up because once it's gone it's not coming back. That's all I'm asking. It's simple, it's reasonable, and there's no personal attack. It's said that delay is not necessarily denial. Why not at least give the whole system a trial? Isn't it worth supporting the desires of the paid volunteers who provide stellar services at a fraction of the cost? to all of you. We're not asking to forever keep dispatch, although that would be great, but simply asking that you honor the commitment that a year ago did make. To the dedicated servants who are there 24-7, seven days each week, holidays too, no matter what nationality, religion, nor language we speak. Always a presence, and that is a given. Hard work and dedication, more than making a living. And give they have without any expectations to receive, other than anticipating to have faith and believe that a promise made should be a promise kept, passionate pleas for which one dispatcher wept. That's all the fight I have left for you this evening. Three minutes is what I wrote. I simply ask you that your values to the town and yourselves are reflected in your vote. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. I knew I didn't want to go after Carl. I've actually written a song. <laughs> Please, no. It'll be acapella. <laughs> no, I actually um, came up because I did hear Tom mention the K-8 through plan that Kate for All had, had proposed, and I had a chance to look at that. Um, my name's Mary Townsend. I live at 5 Pearl Street. I'm addressing you as a citizen, not as a school board member. Um, I looked at it because I thought it was an interesting idea and what I found was it does create, it, it's used in large urban areas to create small neighborhood schools um, where the middle school model fails. Um, it's where, you know, you have these small neighborhood elementary schools and kids are then bused into these large feeder middle schools and kids lose academic and personal confidence. So they take small schools like for instance the small school in South Portland and turn them into K through 8 schools. Um, and they find that keeping kids in their own neighborhoods with the same teachers and students is helpful, especially in low performing districts. It's targeted to low perform performing districts. Um, here in Cape we already have a community based school. Um, with a thriving middle school model, and student achievement does support this. So it, it, it's not a model that I see, it's apples and oranges. Um, as I said, it's, in, it's used in small schools, and Cape K through eight has over 1,100 students, aged four through 14. Um, so you can imagine what would happen if you followed the proposal, cut the administration in half, and expect half of the administration to do double the work and have the same out student outcome. It's just, it's implausible. Um, so finally, and most importantly, I think were we to convert through this K through eight model, we would lose our exemption, which I think we would all agree, um, we don't, um, we would prefer to stay local. Um, in the end, consolidation would cost our district much more because we'd be paying for the inefficiencies of other towns. Um, so while I applaud this, you know, the Cape for All for um, their work and their effort, and I appreciate the time that they've spent um, as a citizen, I would encourage them to take their efforts to the next level um, and go to the state government and the federal government rather than considering um, 
rather than continuing to chip away at our institution here in Cape Elizabeth. Um, I have more that I could say, but I think I'll stop there and just say I think um, the voting booth, as David Backer says, is the great equalizer, and maybe that's where the point six should go. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. My name is Casey Pearson of 27 Fowler Road. I'm a lieutenant on the rescue and a dispatcher for the town of Cape. I've used our dispatch system in many times and from every perspective. As a dispatcher, I've answered many emergency calls, many of which where I knew the caller. I knew where they lived. I knew what their house looked like. I knew how to get there, how to get in, and how to send responders to get there quickest. If someone calls Portland, they're not going to know who they are. They're not going to know the back roads. They're not going to know the bridges or the gates. They're going to need to look at maps. They're going to need to touch computers. They're going to need to use the electronics in front of them, which costs time. I know where these people live because I've lived in this town my entire life. I know from memory how to get to these places. It saves a lot of time not having to go through a computer, through a map, flip through a book, ask these questions that I already know the answer to. All the dispatchers in Cape share this attribute. On many times I've been on the other end. I've been the one making the call. I've called Greg, one of the best friend of mine, hurt himself severely in the Murray sand pit. I told him where I was, in the gravel pit. He knew exactly where I was. He didn't have to look on a map. He didn't need an address. He could send the units there. Just yesterday, a family member of mine was hurt in a motorcycle accident in front of my house. All I did was pick up the phone. I called 767-3323. Greg answered. I said, Greg, it's Casey. I need an ambulance at my house right now. He sent one. He knew I was capable of taking care of the patient. He didn't have to EMV the call and waste time. He sent the units. Within two minutes, I had two police officers, three firefighters, two fire police units blocking the road. Within five minutes, I had the ambulance. On our way to the hospital, Greg thought to check the bridge. Good thing, the bridge was going up. If he hadn't warned us of that, we wouldn't have been able to step up the call and beat the bridge. We could have been stuck on the bridge. We could have had to gone around. My family member could have bled to death on the way to the hospital because we had to wait or take that extra length of time. One dispatcher in Portland, with that many residents, citizens that he has to take care of, wouldn't think of those little details that make a big difference. Many times, as a rescue member, I've picked up my portable, portable 34 to 60. They know exactly who I am. They know what town I'm calling from. All I have to do is say street number and address, and they'll send the units there. They're not asking what town I'm from, what the emergency is. They don't ask those details because they know the answer to it. I'm in their town. I'd get a hundred questions wasting valuable time. I guess the question is what's more important, saving money on your taxes or saving your house, your son, your daughter, your husband, your wife? Seconds matter and this will cost seconds. Thank you, Casey. Adam Weiner, 51 Bowery Beach Road. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty new to Cape Elizabeth. I, I moved up about a year and a half ago from South Carolina, which had uh, probably one of the worst educational systems in America. And I moved to Maine, and now I'm in one of the best, and I'm very happy about that. I was actually a teacher in thir uh, third through eighth grade and a college professor down there. And, you know, I kind of know being in the schools and out of the schools. I have three kids here. I'm just rambling. Very personal things. No facts. No figures. But I have three kids in the school here and I do support the schools. Uh, and I consider myself very liberal. I don't think there's a cause that I would not give money to or help if I could. So um, about a month ago, I was asked to sit in on this uh, Cape for All group. And I said, oh my god, what am I getting myself into? These people are just a bunch of rich 
people who don't want who are too old and don't want to give any money to the schools. I'm going to have a fun time with them. And I sat there for the first few times and I said, you know, I questioned everything that they said. But they started to make sense. They're not about cutting uh, money from, they're not taking food out of my kids' mouths. They want to be more fiscally responsible. They want to look to the future. You know, they want to make the school budget more transparent. And, you know, even though I would probably never vote in the same way as any of those people, you know, uh, for the president or anybody else, uh, you know, I think they, they make a lot of sense. They might not, you know, you know, they're putting things out there for you and, you know, maybe they're not perfect in those suggestions, but they're trying to, to make some change. And I think, uh, you know, for that, they should be, you know, kind of listened to and what they say seriously considered. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Hi, my name is Richard Dunham, and I live at 30 Ocean View Road. I'm one of those they people, too. Um, <laughs> so I was at this podium in, uh, at the start of the budget process, budget cycle this year, and um, I urged you to uh, have the belief that we could get through this season with no tax increase and we can get through with the most excellent schools. I'm sorry to say I, I'm not have, I don't have the great confidence um, that we're going to be able to do that and I feel like we're going to head for a season of vote and counter vote. I'm sorry I don't have confidence in the, uh, the current school board's process to get to higher performing cost effective schools. There seems to be just too much time spent on justifying spending, marketing of spending, and reasoning on why you need to spend more, but less time on um, effectiveness of spending. So two issues, the process that we use for the budgeting on the school side and the prioritization. At the start of the season, there were a bunch of uh, citizens that put forth the idea that we needed to start from the bottom and do a zero base budget from the ground up. And with that suggestion, the response that we got was that we do that every year. We do it. It's painstaking. We're relentless. We're scrutinized. It's meticulous. But then they went on to pick a target out of the air, and instead of building a budget from zero up and taking into the entire system, they did a process where they went department by department in silos and just said, come up with a 2% uh, increase. Silo approach, not a systematic approach. So by the end of the budget process, we got through that. So recently, the superintendent was quoted in the paper as saying, next year, we, we are coming into a new era, era. Next year, we are going to look at every component of the budget from the superintendent to every person in the system and look at what is the positive effect on learning of every person in that system. So we get to, at this point, we do it every year too. Next year, we're going to do it. It'll be different next year. The other issue that I have is the prioritization of, the, uh, of how we budget. Also, during other public forum, forums, I witnessed a lot of citizens coming up to this podium, and they talked about classrooms without books and leaky roofs and teachers that don't have chairs to sit in. And that all sounds really, really good, but it kind of felt to me like the school elected officials and non-elected leadership we're kind of encouraging and enjoying these tales of hardship. Now I understand the marketing. If you want to get a bigger budget, having a parent come up here and say, my teacher doesn't have a chair and we had to raise money for a chair for the teacher. That sounds, that sounds like good stuff. Um, so I understand the marketing, but if you don't zero up, why wouldn't we pay for all those things first? We buy the essentials first, then we add on from there. It probably wouldn't be as good a marketing if some parent came to the podium and said, my poor child has uh, less non-teaching administrative positions than Falmouth does. That probably wouldn't play as much. So at the end of that, I'd like to get past this manipulative form of budgeting and go zero-based on up, and then we'll have more trust in the system going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Good evening. Um, my name is Chris Brigham. I live at 34 Rockcrest Drive, and I'd like to take a minute first to thank you for all of your time and energy that you've invested in the budget process. I know it is substantial, and it is appreciated. At this juncture in the process, I would like to encourage you to set aside your preconceived notions about tax rates 
and instead think about what effect your decisions will have on the educational system here in Cape Elizabeth, and as a direct corollary to that, how you will impact the desirability of our community to prospective real estate buyers. You have heard throughout the school board's budget review exercises that cuts which are reflected in the point six budget sent to you by the board will adversely impact students. The cuts, which include teachers at Pond Cove in the high school, stipends for all outdoor educational experiences, freshman athletic <coughs> programs, reduction in choral instruction, several technology electives, teacher leadership and ed tech positions were made by the school board in deference to the current economic climate. These cuts certainly do nothing to improve our educational system. In fact, they delay significant forward movement. In order to invest in those things which we deemed most valuable, like our staff, we will be forced to forgo participation in the state's proposed laptop initiative, among other missed opportunities. If you do not approve this 6.6% budget, the additional cuts which will be required to meet your tax rate goal will have a significantly adverse and direct effect on our students. By nearly all me measures, we are one of the most financially efficient school districts in Greater Portland, and perhaps even the state. Our per-pupil per school spending is below the state average. Our administrative, transportation, maintenance costs, etc., represent a smaller share of our budget than these costs represent in neighboring school districts. Our teachers, compensation levels, even with the rate increases that you heard earlier this evening, leave them in the middle of the pack for the school districts in Greater Portland. There is no place left to cut that will not do further damage to our schools. It was recently reported in the newspaper that only three to four people attended the Yarmouth Town Council's public hearing on their proposed budget. The school budget which was presented there is slated to raise taxes 1.8%. The median household income in Yarmouth is 58,000. In Cape, it's 72,000. The average selling price for a home in Yarmouth is 184,000. And in Cape, it's 185,000. So our community, which according to these statistics has a greater ability to bear a tax increase, is engaged in a debate over 0.6% increase, while that community is poised to vote on a 1.8% tax rate increase. One conclusion that one might draw from this comparison is that Yarmouth taxpayers recognize that good schools require adequate resources, and by all means, Yarmouth has great schools. Here in Cape, we say we want great schools, but our seemingly myopic focus on tax rates not just this year in a bad economy, but in years when the economy was far stronger, seems to create a disconnect between our rhetoric and our reality. Please give our community members the opportunity to vote on the budget sent to you by the school board. Thank you. Thank you, Trish. Hi, my name is Christine McKenzie. I live at 58 Brentwood Road. I'm gonna echo a couple of the things that Trish Brigham just said. Uh, recent cuts, from the state based on what's called the essential programs and services suggest that the state of Maine, in particular the Department of Education, believe that Cape Elizabeth's townspeople are capable of contributing more toward our schools. They've looked at data across the state and that data tells them that we in our community can afford to contribute more. Whether we agree with the findings or want to pay more, their conclusion is that we as a whole community can. The state does not think that Cape spends too much on its schools. Indeed, Cape Elizabeth was one of only a small handful of towns whose schools were deemed high performing and efficient, and therefore exempt from the school consolidation law of 2007. This distinction was made before our school district cut its curriculum coordinator, a job now being done by our overworked superintendent. <coughs> this high efficiency was noted before the Mac computer lab at the high school was eliminated. This was before middle school athletic program costs were shifted to parents before the reduction in technology electives at the high school, before the loss of the executive skills teacher at the high school, and the ed tech system wide. Those are jobs right here in Cape Elizabeth that are being lost. You don't have to look across the world to find them. One of the few things that was the same when this distinction was made is the age of our textbooks. In that regard, we remain especially efficient, it seems. The process that we're part of tonight is designed this way. The superintendent delivers a budget to the school board. The school board sends the budget to the town council. The town council decides whether to send that school budget to the townspeople or not. The majority of the seven of you decided that $200,000 of our taxpayer money should go to offset the state subsidy losses. 
I ask that you allow the thousands of voting citizens in Cape Elizabeth to decide if our efficiency and high performance are worth the modest tax increase that we're now subject to due to these state subsidy reductions. Let us decide if the folks responsible for running these terrific schools have made the right decisions for this year's budget by sending the budget to us, the voters, as it came to you, the councillors. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Hi, I'm Dan Fishbein of Salisbury Lane. Sorry, I have laryngitis. I'll do the best I can. Um, I appreciate that you do what you do as volunteers. I do want to mention that the vote you took to only consider a school budget equal to or lower, but not higher than the budget in front of you tonight, and to therefore prescribe in advance of a public hearing that you would not consider all points of view was an error. I urge you tonight to allow the citizens to vote on the school budget recommended by the school board, which results in a minimal tax increase of just 0.6%. The school board, superintendent, town manager, and you have done an extraordinary job of responding to the huge challenges thrown in front of you, which include an economic crisis and a last minute half million dollar cut from the state. Make no mistake about it though, the budget in front of you is not good for our schools. It includes many cuts continuing the pattern of recent years. My preference would be to have had the opportunity to vote on a budget that would support fewer cuts, like a 2 to 3 percent increase, similar to what many communities around us are considering. I am saddened that some in our community appear to want to diminish what was just several years ago, uh, what was recognized as one of the best school systems, not just in Maine, but in the nation. Let me remind you of a few key statistics, which I found today on the State Department of Education's website. In 1995, Cape Elizabeth was in the top 25 out of about 260 school districts in the amount that it invested in education per pupil. By 2007, which is the most recent year available, we had fallen from 25th to 162nd in the state. We are now in the bottom half, and we now also spend less than the state average per pupil. During this period, the average Maine community increased its investment in its children by 5.6% per year. During that same period, we increased ours by only 3.5% per year. No question about it, we are steadily deconstructing what was once a great school system and funding it to be an average or below average system. Now some actually ask, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that is that the single most important factor that has driven our high property values has been our school system. It's not our green spaces, our rural character, or the very small percentage of oceanfront homes. It is our schools. Forgetting that it is a virtue to educate our children, which some indeed seem to have forgotten, it is frankly foolish to diminish our number one asset and in the process destroy our own home values. In order to save a small amount on next year's property tax bill, we are well on our way to reducing the average home value by $100,000 or more. Finally, I am astonished by the overt selfishness that is expressed in some of these discussions. Saving a few dollars on the tax bill is not positioned as something that will enable some other virtuous goal to be achieved. It is simply presented as, I want a few more dollars in my pocket, period, and often by people who are quite well off. We have already seen our schools decline. Already Yarmouth is viewed as the district to move to for new residents coming to the area. Please stop this foolishness and allow us to vote on the very small school budget increase that the school board has recommended to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Hello. My name is Paula Banks and I live at 30 Grover Road. I am here tonight in support of keeping the dispatch local here in our Cape Elizabeth. Um, I've lived in Cape Elizabeth for the past 16 years and I have two children who've gone through Cape schools. I am here tonight as a taxpayer but also as a social worker, as a business owner. I own two businesses here in Cape Elizabeth that serve the elderly, but most important I'm a mom. Uh, the need for local dispatch was highlighted by the very eloquent woman who spoke earlier. But I'd like to add a couple of things to her story um, and personal experience. I moved to this town 16 years ago as a young parent and prospective taxpayer, and I looked to raise my children here. For that reason, I was uh, very interested in excellent schools, 
but public safety was also a priority. In this debate on taking dispatch out of Cape Elizabeth, I am hearing words like streamlined, efficient, simple, consolidation. These are all reasons for eliminating local dispatch. I don't want my calls going to local cities. If I had wanted to live and in a bigger city and access um, more bureaucracy, I would never have left Boston. As a social worker, a geriatric social worker and business owner, I work with local elders in this town. I'm very active in the senior to senior program at the high school and I also work with people who have physical and mental illnesses. Um, I know we were all really disturbed by the stories in the papers last week about the horribly tragic incident in South Portland where police officers are being called to have more training in working or responding to calls with the mentally ill. While I would never be silly enough to never say never, I highly doubt that that would happen here in Cape Elizabeth with our dispatch. And the reason is that I have worked and collaborated with the Cape Elizabeth Police Department um, for many years now in many of my cases. Casey, Ed, Greg, Wes, all of these guys, they know us. They know our children, they know our families, and they know our elders. They know who's sick, they know who's not, they know the whole story. And that's why in my mind it's really critical to not let them leave. I, I, in working with the elderly, I don't know if many of you even know about the Great Starts program or the Triad program run through the police department. These are wonderful services that serve our elderly and it's really critical in a town like Cape Elizabeth at a time when more and more seniors are choosing to stay home because of the economy, uh, but also more services both uh, locally, nationally um, are being cut. So services like Great Starts and Triad, we can't afford to lose those. Um, I just really believe that this decision to take our dispatch and move it was unsafe and a poor decision. And I do believe it's being spun to make what was just a plain bad decision palatable. As a social worker, but just more as a citizen and most of my friends, we look to building community and not systematically dismantling it. Please don't allow it to happen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. My name's Dave Griffin, Five Channel View Road. I'd like to spend a minute here um, maybe giving you some numbers that will back up what Mr. Hillman said the, about the train wreck <clears throat> that's about ready to hit us. When planning ahead, one can better understand our need to curtail budgets now. If we don't save our stimulus and other windfall monies for next year's needs, we must either renegotiate the pricey contracts approved by the school board, cut a number of teachers, or drive teetering homeowners into bankruptcy through higher taxes. Either one of these scenarios will lead to an unprecedented community divide. The following figures are not included in the town of school spending budget next year. I have a list of some of the the things that may confront us coming up next year. A high risk is the possibility of oil prices going back up to $4 <coughs> rather than the $2 that they're at right now. That would amount to about $340,000. A high risk is the stimulus money we saw the state claw back. <coughs> They literally, or they likely, will be clawing that back next year. That's $275,000. A high-risk possibility is the MEA insurance premiums going up 20%. That would be $327,000. A definite increase will be the, the disappearance of the uh, community uh, valuation. That's $42,000. And a high possibility is a Medicaid subsidy disappearance as a, as a state would see to claw it back. That would be another $90,000. And the Medicaid subsidy is a high risk. And that's 
about $90,000. And then you've got the teachers' 5.4 salary increase, which we need to plan for uh, the years 2010-2011 budget. That's $680,000. And the $200,000 that you gave to the school board this year, we need to repay in 2010-2011. That's $200,000. That adds up to $1,904,000. So we're not faced with it this year, but we are faced with it the next budget round. And what Cape for All is really pushing for and is anxious to see is to go on to a three-year budget cycle instead of a one-year budget cycle. And I'll turn these over to you. You can pass them out to you. Thank you, Dave. My name's Harold Pacius. I live at uh, 882 uh, Shore Road. I think what you just heard uh, sums mm -hmm. up the issue. We're in for a long haul. Uh, the University of Maine is having some very substantive cutbacks. The new president of the University of, Selma, uh, uh, of Southern Maine, Selma Botman, did what I think all public servants need to do. She said, this is the way it's going to be, and we can still give a first-rate education to kids. We just have to figure out how we're going to do it. But I'm not going to tell you that the school is going to stink. I'm not going to tell you we cannot deliver a first-rate education and still make changes. And that's what I hope this town does. Uh, we've gotten ourselves, I've been around here for a long time. I started uh, school in Cape Elizabeth 65 years ago. There's another guy here, just in another woman, they're close by me. Uh, but uh, we're into this business of 2%, 1%, 0%, and if you're against 1%, then you're against schools. That's ridiculous. That's not the issue. The issue is the interaction between good teachers and students and educating them. I was on the school board for six years here. Not long ago, I think, 20 some odd years ago, that wasn't very long. Uh, and we had the same thing. You know, schools uh, are in the business of creating menus. They have to. They have constituency. <coughs> They have interest groups. My kid likes Y, doesn't like A. Give us Y. Uh, at this very <coughs> desk that you're sitting at, uh, I sat there and people came and said, you can't cut Latin. If you cut Latin, we're going to have an awful school system, and my kid's not going to get into school, into college. We cut Latin. We had to. We didn't want to cut Latin. I loved Latin. I got the certificate in Latin at Cape <laughs> Elizabeth High School. But we cut Latin because we didn't want to cut something else. Then uh, about a year later, we had to cut home ec. You, this room was full, many more people than there are here tonight, pointing fingers and saying, you have ruined the school system in Cape Elizabeth. So everything that the school does is good. Everything that the school does is important. But you'll have to make choices. Everybody's making choices. The budget at Bowdoin College is being cut back significantly. The budget at Princeton University is being cut. And I bet they're not saying, folks, we won't be able to deliver a good education. You have to make choices. And you have to be careful. And you can't cut too much. And you can't increase too much. And you have to be prudent. I've heard every response except the factual ones. I've heard, well, this is good for the property values. That's not the issue whether it's good for the property values. Frankly, speaking for myself, I hope my property value goes down. You know, it, we're not here. I live in the house. I came here to live, not to make an investment. We hear about mandates. Oh, they, they make us do it. We passed a constitutional amendment in this state in 1993, 1992 was the last time we had unfunded mandates unless two-thirds of the legislature voted for it. There have been 20 of them since then. I got them right here. I've read every one of them. There's not much money required there. So let's get to the facts. Let's find a way.
to maintain a good education system. We had it when we cut Latin. We had it when we cut Home Act. We had it when we made difficult decisions. We're, de we're dedicated to that, but we can do it. Somebody's got to say, okay, look, if it's a zero budget because this is tough times, I can perform. I can deliver a first class education. Excuse me, Harold, I just ask you to wind Thank you. Thank you, Harold. My name is Fred Prince. I'm at 2 Rocky Hill Road. Three things. One, the four. Three years ago, 66% of the people said they wanted the town to pay for the fort. The budget at that time, I believe, was $50,000. As reported in the Cape Courier in the last issue, or the year, issue before that, that the fort needed help because their budget was $175,000. $125,000 increase. Duh. Why aren't we back to 50? Number one. Number two. The fort says they need more money. Well, the football boosters raised $600,000 for artificial turf and $600,000 for uh, a stadium and did it on their own money. And yet the fort comes around all the time crying they need more of my money to do what they want to do to make the fort a better place. I would suggest they raise the money or get out of that position. On the schools and on the dispatches, if you give up those dispatches, you're giving up the working people who are doing it. Governor, uh, Governor Baldacci did not fire teachers, he fired administrators. And he said the way you combine is by combining administrators, not by getting rid of the people who are doing the actual work. If you put the dispatches into a regional po uh, 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 a position, you have the same problem you have right now with your health insurance. As I understand it, you're paying the unions $3 million for your health insurance. What did you pay it for? You don't know. Imagine coming home and saying to your wife, I just spent $500,000 for something, and she said, what? I don't know. <laughs> and imagine the union coming to you and saying, we need a 12% increase. For what? We don't know. These claims came in, we have to pay them. Well, I'll tell you something. From what I understand, it's a $100 deductible. I just quoted a case where they had a $500 deductible. I saved them 38%. Do the math. That's a million two in savings. And that doesn't affect anybody. And if you do it smartly, you can make it so the plan's a better plan. This is not an advertisement for me. I'm not doing that anymore. But all I'm saying is there's games in there. You've got a $20 million budget. I can't believe for a moment there isn't 5% raising. That's a million dollars. That's a half a million dollars for this year and a half a million dollars for next year, which you're going to need because we're broke. The state is broke. The government is broke. I think if you have a budget where you say to people, well, the state's going to give us $500,000. From where? They're broke. Make it so you have a budget with no state money. If the state comes in, that's a surplus. Good God. Look around you, what's going on? 10% unemployment. And we're having 5% raises? Give me a break. Get a grip. We have people in this town who don't have jobs. They're not worried about what you're worried about, an increase. You know, a 6% increase every year doubles in 12 years. How about a decrease? I'm done. <laughs> My name is Paul Katsos. I live at 33 Columbus Road. I wish to thank you for the opportunity to speak and for your hard work on the budget. Uh, I been, feel very fortunate. I had three children and two of them are through the Cape school system and it served them very well. Uh, and I think the school system continues to serve uh, our community well and enriches the lives not just of the students but the whole community. Um, however, it's a labor intensive industry. As someone who has a job employing other people who deliver a service. I know that the service can only be as good as the people who you hire. And the quality of the service is directly dependent on the quality of the applicants who we can keep and who we can draw in the future. Um, Trish Brigham outlined some of the cuts which the school has already incurred based upon the proposed budget. And I urge you to endorse the budget put forth by the school superintendent so that you can protect the property values from declining. I, for one, don't look forward to seeing my property values decline in any sense, and I doubt that many other capers do. Additionally, the most important piece is to help us to ensure that our current students are well-educated and that the students of the future are well-educated. 
and I thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Paul. Um, my name is Karen Burke, and I live at Seven Brook Road. Um, I am a member of the Cape Elizabeth School Board, but I am not speaking on behalf of the board tonight, but as a citizen of the town of Cape Elizabeth. Um, we are in tough times right now, times that are challenging for our town, times that are challenging for our schools. More and more, our community members are being asked to shoulder the financial burden if we want to maintain important town services and if we want to maintain a certain level of excellence in our schools. I'm here tonight to share some thoughts on the school piece as I am concerned that the continual focus on lowering our taxes is resulting in the slow but significant decline in our ability to deliver a quality education. Uh, there are several community members unhappy with the management of our schools. Uh, they say that our schools are spending too much, that our administrative costs are still too high, that even more faculty and staff should be cut, that educational programs are outdated and ineffective, that our students don't need all of the programs and opportunity being offered, and the list goes on. The reasons seem to vary. Concern about people living on fixed incomes, belief that we could be doing things differently and better for less, comparison to the way things used to be, motivation to promote an aggressive tax form, reform agenda, anger at specific teachers, principals, and or the superintendent for personal reasons, distrust or dislike of people from away, or people who seem to have more financially, resentment of taxes in general, regardless of ability to pay or the services those revenues provide. Many citizens have thoughtfully come forward with helpful suggestions during this budget process. On several occasions, these suggestions have been explored and even implemented. Some community members have been more aggressive, expecting and demanding time of already overwhelmed administrators and our town and business managers with the intention of pushing forward personal agendas and opinions. A couple of citizens have even been personally insulting. Difficult times can bring out the worst in people but they can also bring out the best in people. Right now, there are faculty, staff, and administrators working very hard on a multitude of complex issues facing our school district. Is there important work to be done? Absolutely. Could we improve upon things such as curriculum, instruction, and assessment, which, could, which gets at the core of our mission and vision as a school? No question. Do the faculty, staff, and administrators take excellence in education and innovation seriously? Do they want to move us forward as a school district in a thoughtful and cost-conscious way? And are they competent professionals who can lead us where we want to go? I believe most definitely. But the more important question is, are we as a community supporting them in a way that enables and empowers them to be successful? I would encourage you to take the time to ask them. A well-respected young man who grew up in our community said something interesting to me the other day. He said that he found it particularly hard to watch and listen at our public hearings because the parents he knew when he was growing up used to be the people strongly advocating on behalf of our schools, and now they were advocating for school budget cuts. This is something worth reflecting on. I hope going forward as we venture through some, uh, two sentences, through some of these uncharted waters that decisions made will not result in tax reform that hampers our ability to deliver a quality education. It will require extraordinary leadership and hopefully leadership that strives to bring us together as a community, not divide us as a community. I hope we are up for the task because the possibilities are endlessly positive when people work together to make great things happen. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Karen. Hi, my name is Jessica Sullivan, and I live at 38 Cranbrook Drive. I'm in favor of keeping our local dispatch. I'd like to see the school board offer a 0% increase in their budget. Um, we're down 90 students since 2006, and I, I look at everything, I try to read everything, and I just can't get beyond the fact that enrollment keeps going down. The state's predicting that will be a trend through 2018. So why are our costs going up? Um, I want to ask you to remember that there are many people in Cape Elizabeth who live on low income and fixed income. And some of these people have uh, children in the schools. 
I actually know of a family that had children in the school here and because of the economy and lost jobs and the cost of everything, they've left. They had to leave. So I would ask you to all remember that. The difficult task before us all is to cut spending. But, you know, everyone's having to cut. I think the school budget, well, it is, I think, the largest part of the town budget overall. And again, the difficult task is to cut spending, but I think that's what needs to happen. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Hi, I'm Mary Page. I live at 172 Two Lights Road, and I'm here to for the dispatchers. Um, I've used the dispatching many times. I know Greg. I know a lot of the people personally. The first time was very impressive. My house was on fire. My children were one and two years old. It just snowed 12 inches that night. It was 1 o'clock in the morning. I called. I was on the phone trying to get the kids out of the house. Greg was on the phone with Public Works. I was on the phone with him. The snowplow truck went by. Officer Westbury was right behind him, and Danny O'Brien was behind him. They in turn grabbed the kids, got them out of the house, got them in the vehicle. Fire trucks were able to come in and save our house. That was amazing. Next day, they came by, they checked on us, made sure we, we, everybody was okay. It was phenomenal. Second time was also unbelievable. I own a business here in town. My children were involved in a car accident. The babysitter was unconscious. They were going surfing. It was at the corner of Fowler Road and 77. S Greg, the police officers knew, said, we think these are the Page children. An off-duty police officer came down to my business, got me, we went down. It was my children in this car accident. I rode with them to, in the ambulance, and thank God I was there because they did need medical treatment. To be able to take these dispatchers away would be <coughs> sad because how many places can you say they knew they knew it was us. They knew it was our kids. They knew it was our house. And it was amazing what they did. And to take them away would be sad. And to make a phone call to say, hi, who am I speaking with? And not know is difficult. So, thank you. Thank you, Mary. Good evening, all. My name is Ann Nealon. I'm a resident of Old Ocean House Road here in Cape Elizabeth. I also happen to be a co-owner in a business here in Cape Elizabeth, and I thank you for this forum tonight. I'm here on behalf of uh, supporting our uh, retaining the uh, dispatches uh, with the Cape Elizabeth uh, Police and Fire Department. Needless to say, as a, an individual, um, I have come in contact with any number of them on a number of occasions, particularly around public safety, and the most recent one was with Mr. Tinsman in a road race that was um, uh, run here in Cape where um, I was actually directed by a volunteer out into uh, traffic where I would have probably been involved in a four or five car accident. And when I got home and got my shoulders down from my ears, I was able to call and speak directly with him and report what had gone on and ask who I should speak to about uh, the possibility of um, another way of monitoring a race here in this town when it comes to uh, input from um, the police and, and fire. So. Again, that's a personal aside. More importantly, though, in why I wanted to speak to you this evening is I happen to be one of those in the community with my business that does get an opportunity to, and an honor to go into people's homes, and particularly those of our elderly and infirm. And the work that I have been able to do with your dispatchers here has been phenomenal, life-saving, as has also been mentioned, um, where you have uh, rescue personnel that actually arrive and know what's going on in a home before I can even describe to them what has gone on. Um, so please know that, um, again, as I know others have mentioned, uh, Portland and South Portland are wonderful cities, but this is the town of Cape Elizabeth, and this is why many of us are here, not only to live, but to work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ann. Hi, I'm Trish Wasserman at Running Tide Road, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, it seems that we've had some very contentious views expressed here tonight diametrically opposite points of view, um, very articulated beautifully with passion and conviction, a little bit contentious, but in all this I'm hearing some common themes that leave me with actually quite a bit of hope, um, hope that we can build on whatever our views are expressed, 
you know, I do hear that we all love our town. We all cherish our neighbors. We all want to protect and help anybody in need. We all care about our schools. We all value the many individuals and groups who weave the threads that really hold our town together. You know, our many volunteer groups, we've heard about our, our safety uh, volunteers here tonight and our dispatch, we, the stewards of our land, our farming community, the great groups that have aligned in tough times to make things work on so many levels. Our elected officials, um, our town employees, our amazing network of senior citizens, concerned parents, brilliant business minds who have come up with some great ideas to think about in our schools and in our town. And I take heart that if we focus on this common ground, if we really come away from here tonight saying, we all do care, and we continue to pool all of these great resources we have right in this room, that we can continue to come up with reasonable compromises, creative solutions to the fiscal challenges we now face, but also those challenges of maintaining ourselves as a community that's together and not divisive as we attack these problems. And so, well, I personally, I, I want to thank you. I do believe you've come up with a great compromise, a 0.6% budget that will allow us to at least preserve the base of so many of these things that we value in the town. I urge all of us in this room to continue to come back here and support you as your Lincoln's cabinet. Let us come back and argue and put our minds together and disagree, um, but then eventually come up with reasonable solutions and compromises like you have. And I urge you to support that very <laughs> modest increase for now and allow us all to continue in this process of helping you help us remain a really strong and vibrant community, even in these tough economic times. Thank you for all that you're doing. Thank you, Trish. Good evening. I'm Jerry Angel and I live on Westminster Terrace in the Cape. I look around the room tonight and I look at one of the counselors and I can't wait for her store to open because I'm looking forward to your fresh vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> I went to a meeting and I got home tonight and I turned on the TV and I was watching this erstwhile group and, and the volunteers as well as the citizens of the town and it was very interesting to see what they, their comments were. And uh, it seems to me to make some sense to allow the citizens to vote on a budget item as far as the uh, school committee is concerned in the school budget. Uh, we have 9,500 people who live in this community and I suspect that uh, their wisdom uh, will carry the day in a very positive way. I wanted to uh, come down from the house tonight to comment on uh, the dispatch system. It was a pleasure to go in and visit with one of the dispatchers the other day and talk to him about another matter. And I said, uh, how are you doing? And he said, well, I'm doing all right. And I said, what are you going to be doing? He said, well, I don't know. And I said, well, remember, there's an old expression in Philadelphia. It ain't over till the fat lady sings. And he laughed, and he said, you're right. And I said, uh, you got something in the wind? And he said, well, I probably can go to Portland. And I said, how would that be? And he said, well, Portland wouldn't be too bad because there's more than one dispatcher on duty at a time. He said, just this morning, we had an accident down at Spurlink at the light. We had two cruisers, we had the wet team. I'm not sure why the wet team was there, but they were there. And there was a fire truck and an ambulance. And he said, I was trying to coordinate all that, and I got a couple of calls, including a cat in a tree. So you have to take all that into uh, one, into, uh, you know, you have to work with all that. And the interesting thing was that he said, if I go to Portland, there's more than one dispatcher on duty at a time. So he said, when we get a call, or I get a call like that, I'm going to be able to concentrate on that call. Now, I have a boat, and I suspect there's some people watching on television tonight, and there's some people here in the room that also have a boat. And if you have GPS, the GPS system will put you within 30 feet of where you want to go. Now, your living room may not be that big, but your house probably is, and the GPS system in the computerized world we live in today can put an ambulance, a uh, fire truck, or a police cruiser, not only in your driveway, but if you open the door, probably you could put it in your living room. We looked at the price, I understand from reading the paper, of $16.22 for the county 
and I have been involved with the county for five years as far as their space needs committee is concerned, and I'm chair of that committee, and I'm proud to be serving on that committee. The county has a dispatch center window, $16.22 per head is what I read. Portland and South Portland together, getting together with Cape Elizabeth will be $16 per head. We already have joint service with South Portland and Portland in the fire department in that area. So, yes, I appreciate what the Pearson duo said tonight, and I wish I could write poems. I never was good at that, and Carl's poem was marvelous, I thought. But I don't think our town will lose anything from the dispatch in today's electronic world, whether we have dispatch in Portland, South Portland, or Cape Elizabeth. And I would share with you something that's very interesting. I could ask if, you to wind up, please, Jerry. Okay, if you have a uh, emergency call in New Hampshire, there are two dispatch centers for the entire state of New Hampshire. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Hello, I'm Sheila Mayberry. I live at 30 Trinity Road. Uh, I just want to make one comment about the process that has gone on uh, here. I have to tell you that I'm a mediator and an arbitrator dealing in labor management relations. I've mediated um, contract negotiations all over the state. I recently got back from a place in northern Maine where we spent about three hours uh, negotiating $1,200, and that was the gap in uh, the, the budget there. We did find a solution to the problem. Uh, this situation is, is the same. Uh, it's just a different scale. You have done an incredible job in uh, coming to a uh, 0.6% uh, budget. Uh, the school board uh, has to negotiate that union contract three years. Uh, we're going to be in a second year next year. Uh, that's something that you have to live by. Um, to make the kind of cuts that the board made in this budget is uh, heroic. And as several people said, it's going to be really tough next year. I think that you should believe in what this board has done and work with it and figure out how to deal with the coming issues next year in a constructive way. The CFA group uh, certainly has ideas that perhaps are worth looking at uh, in the long run, but we are dealing with the here and the now. You've done a really great, hard job. Go forward and do what you need to do. And as a citizen, I support the point for that. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Good evening. Rosemary Townsend from Seven Fieldstone Road in Brentwood. And I am part of the for-profit working world. And I can tell you that we have been asked to cut our budget over the last year uh, substantially so that we now operate with two-thirds the staff that we had a year ago. Mm -hmm. And we have all been asked to step up and operate at a higher level. So. I think that those institutions that rely on taxpayer money need to reflect what is, in fact, going on in the for-profit world. Uh, therefore, I do support a zero increase. In fact, I think that in the current environment, we should probably look at a decrease of an increase. But I will go along with a zero increase because I do support strong schools. Strong schools happen in the classroom not in administration. Thank you. Thank you, Rosemary. May I speak a second time? I don't know what your rules are. Yeah, it is getting late. Uh, we have allowed, we're trying to allow everybody a chance to speak, and, and we do have a, a significant <coughs> schedule ahead of us. No notes. Hi. Carl Diffitch, 500 Ocean House Road. Whether you like the old president or the new president, they have one thing in common, and that is the role of government is to protect the citizens. It trumps the schools, it trumps the plowing, it trumps everything. Um, the Rolling Stones, Bruce Springsteen, and the Beach to Beacon all have one thing in common. They all sell out within two minutes. I haven't heard any answers tonight. I've heard a lot of questions, this and that. 
If we raised it $15, it would still sell out. It's the country's premier 10K raise. That would be an instant $90,000, a la it would help the dispatchers. Um, and like I said five years ago, the little gift shop at Fort Williams, our gift to the world, does $650,000 worth of business out of a two-car garage. God forbid we sell the headlight hot dog, Coke and bag of chips, off in a little area, very green, with just one napkin roped in, and we would probably make, I estimate, twenty to $80,000, let alone selling a lobster roll at Kettle Cove. Um, I think it's a big mistake to get rid of the dispatch. It's a personal thing. I think we live in Cape Elizabeth for the mom and pop stores. I remember hearing the council, they don't want chains, they don't want this and that. Um, that personal touch that everyone talked about, um, it's priceless. Like the MasterCard Visa ad says, it's priceless. I think that's what we live here. You know, the schools, yeah, they're talking about the home values. I think part of the home values people seem to forget is that the big Atlantic Ocean over there and the fact that Rue 1 does not go through Cape Elizabeth and we're only 10 minutes from Portland. That's all. Thank you, Carl. Are there others that would like to speak uh, to the budget? Seeing none, I will declare the public hearing closed. Thank you all very much. Now we can start our agenda. Uh, I'd suggest that we have a two-minute break. Stand up and stretch.
What was all about when it was going to be out? He's at home laughing at all of us. Lonely over there, David? <laughs> okay, I'll ask us to come back to order, please. Uh, item number 70 2009, uh, fiscal year 2010 municipal budget. Uh, I'll yield the floor to Finance Committee uh, Chairman Ann Swift Piata. Okay, thank you, Chairman Rowe. Um, I will just outline what the Finance Committee process has been and the conclusions that the Finance Committee came to before turning it back to the Council as a whole. The Finance Committee has had a series of meetings from January through March of this year to review the fiscal year 10 municipal, school, community services, general funds budgets, um, and as well as special funds budgets. After discussion on a number of budget-related topics over those weeks, the Finance Committee voted on March 30th to recommend to the Town Council the following. The Town Council set these numbers for tonight's meeting with the note that the numbers may be changed after the public hearing. The things uh, that the uh, Finance Committee recommended were a municipal budget of $8,533,254, which is a decrease in spending of 3.08% the municipal tax rate would decrease two cents or minus 0.4 percent. The Cumberland County budget of $967,750 would be a decrease in spending of 4.18 percent. The county portion of the tax rate would de decrease four cents or minus five percent. The community services budget of $1,077,933 would be a decrease in spending of $3,030 or minus 0.28%. The community services tax rate would decrease two cents or minus 20.8%. The school budget of $20,005,086 would be an increase in spending of $217,507, or plus 1.1 percent. The school portion of the tax rate would increase 20 cents, or 1.6 percent. The special funds budget, uh, we've got them laid out in tonight's agenda. I won't go through all of those. They um, were approved as attached with a few minor dollar changes here and there that Mike made to correct some small errors, and by small I mean under $100. Uh, the net impact of all these, the decrease in the municipal, county, community services budget, and the increase in the school budget, when taken all together, would be a total tax rate increase of 11 cents, or plus 0.6 percent. That's what the Finance Committee recommended to the Council. I want to thank Mike McGovern, our town manager, the department heads and the town employees, the school board, the superintendent, and school employees who worked so hard on these budgets. It's been a very difficult and challenging year. Uh, and I would also like to thank, on behalf of the Finance Committee, to thank all the citizens who wrote us and contacted us with their priorities and their comments <coughs> on what they wanted the tax rates to be and what they wanted for programs and what they wanted for all sorts of different things. So thank you very much. That's an outline of what we'll be going through tonight. Thank you, Ann. And uh, on behalf of the rest of the council, I'd like to thank you for your chairmanship of the Finance Committee this year. You've done an incredible job of keeping things moving and, and under very trying uh, circumstances. Thank you. And I, I would add that um, I want to in particular thank Kathy Ray of the school board. She's the finance chair for them, and she and I have worked well together, as have the two um, ch board chairs, you and Trish Brigham. So I want to thank uh, Kathy in particular, because it's been a pleasure working with her. Thanks. Um, would, would you like to make a motion regarding the, uh, the proposed fiscal, uh, proposed municipal budget? OK. Um, item number 70. Uh, I move that the Cape Elizabeth Town Council approves the proposed fiscal year 2010 municipal budget 
including $8,533,254 in expenditures, which is a decrease of $270,836, or 3.08%. Uh, it also includes $3,152,500 in revenues from sources other than the property tax, a decrease of $295,000, or 8.56%, with $5,380,754 to be borne by taxation, an increase of $24,164, or 0.45%, with a projected tax rate of $4.03 per $1,000 of assessed valuation. Uh, this is a decrease of $0.02 or 0.4 percent, and the following amounts are listed in the chart on page two of the agenda of all the different departments and the purposes, and I include those as part of my uh, motion. We have a motion. Second. Moved and seconded. Um, open the floor to discussion on the motion. I think Joshua this Jordan. is the appropriate time. I would say that, um, you know, initially I had um, not stated a, a position relative to uh, dispatch um, until I had more information. And um, the more that I delved into it and the more that I, um, I think about it, the more that I feel that I can not support that shift at this point in time, and so therefore there are implications to this number. Um, and some of the things that I think about, and I, I did, uh, I'll share with the people who are here, I did send a, uh, an email to my peers here on the council yesterday uh, stating my position as to why I, uh, I can't support the move at this point in time. And the more that I think about it and the more that I've heard, what I think about it is that we're sending a public service, a public safety element of our town to a, an entity that considers it a revenue stream. It no, I mean, we consider it a service. We pay taxes to have the service. Uh, in Portland, in South Portland, it's revenue. And so then things start to change. And so what's going to happen uh, three years from now? And um, so I just have to put that out there as to um, my position relative to dispatch at this point in time. And I know it impacts the Thank you. Here. Well, I will say that uh, I will not be supporting the proposed budget uh, because of the dispatch issue. Um, a year ago, I was one councilor who told our dispatchers face to face that uh, their jobs would be secure for three years. Uh, this assurance was given in order to help smooth out uh, relationships and to gain a sense of cohesiveness and unity in our community. Whether this assurance is now judged a good thing or a mistake um, has for me not as much relevance as you might expect. My word was given, and that's what I'm going to follow through with. It's very true that underlying circumstances and conditions have, have uh, deteriorated almost unbelievably in the past year. This is probably reasonable grounds for many people, including the manager and my colleagues on the council here, to reconsider and rethink the position uh, that we took with that assurance last year. But you know what? We see flip-flopping every day in, go in government and politics, whether at the federal, state, or local level. And quite frankly, that drives me crazy. What we need in government today, I think, is commitment to principle. The lesson for me here is not that it's okay to go back on your word. Rather, the lesson for me uh, is probably that we shouldn't be giving these kind of assurances to begin with. And I've learned that lesson. Our local dispatch is not broken. There's nothing that needs to be fixed. Our four dispatchers plus the subs do a terrific job, and they deserve our unmitigated thanks, our respect, and our admiration. And I believe they deserve to keep the jobs they apparently love for at least as long as we told them they could keep their jobs. My personal integrity is not for sale, even for projected savings of $127,000. 
And that's tough for me to say because I'm fiscally pretty conservative. But I do think that we'd be losing peripheral services that many of us take for granted. I took the dispatchers up on their invitation to tour the facility, and I also looked at the brochure that they passed out. And you can see some of those services that aren't going to be there if we consolidate dispatch. <coughs> I'm 100% confident that we're still going to be looking for budget savings two years from now, which would be the end of our promise. Even if you're of a mindset that maintaining local dispatch is a mistake, I would personally rather live with this alleged mistake for a couple years than correct it now by making what I believe would be another mistake and in the process destroy what trustworthiness that I have as a public official. So that's why I'm going to be uh, voting against the proposed budget. Uh, I support uh, virtually everything else in the budget, but that's my position. Thank you. Others? David. Since nobody else seems to be stepping forward to say something, um, I'll address the, the regionalization issue with dispatch. And, you know, I think back to where the word regionalization came into most people's vernacular. Um, and it takes me back to the Pulaski tax cap initiative, um, which was on the ballot, the statewide ballot in November of 2004. And it was, and as everybody likely remembers, that came to the ballot as a means of controlling property taxes. And as part of the opposition and as part of the focus, part of the opposition to Pulaski, but as part of the focus on controlling property taxes, people started looking for other alternatives and regionalization became one of the buzzwords. And people, citizens started encouraging elected officials to look at opportunities, to be creative, to find ways to save money to address the continuing rise in property taxes. And the idea was embraced by citizens, it was embraced by elected officials, it was embraced by the media. For most people and for most places it was a concept and there weren't any specifics tied to it. But each year, certainly at budget time, the citizens look to us and we are encouraged, we are, um, we are told that it's our obligation to look for ways to be creative with the budget, with every line item, and to find ways to save money and to stop the ever increasing rise in expenditures and taxes. And we've certainly heard that more than a few times this evening. Um, with various aspects, aspects of the budget, not including dispatch. Um, and the current recession has done nothing but heighten and increase that expectation for us as town councilors to look creatively uh, for ways to reduce expenditures. And it may be worth repeating what will sound trite to some, but that is that the low-hanging fruit has already been picked. To find further savings, we need to reach further each year. Um, and as we reach for further savings, um, it becomes more painful. Um, and that has been the case, uh, certainly on the municipal side of the budget. Early on in this process, we asked our town manager to look at a zero budget. Um, he did so each year for the last several years. The town council has asked the town manager and the department heads to do more with less, and they have repeatedly risen to the challenge, and they continue to provide the services that town citizens expect, and they do it by working harder and working more creatively. Most of the comments that we've heard in opposition to regionalizing dispatch tonight have focused on the threat or the fear of calamitous things that will happen if we regionalize dispatch um, and if we don't have them physically seated in our police station. But what people seem to be overlooking very often here, and as our town manager pointed out in his opening comments, 911 calls do not go to our police station. They haven't for over a year. Um, the current dispatch discussion has nothing to do with 911 calls. 
And what people are also overlooking is that we're going to have the same police, we're going to have the same fire, we're going to have the same volunteer responders that we've always had. And those same volunteer responders that know the Cape Elizabeth streets and the same police officers that know the, the Cape Elizabeth streets are going to continue to respond to a call from dispatch no matter where the dispatcher is. And if we're going to, if we're going to take seriously our responsibility to continue to look for opportunities for regionalization of services with resulting cost savings, we need to be willing to venture into new domains and nothing can be sacrosanct and taken off the table. Um, and after considering all the comments that we've heard tonight, I think there is a sound basis for regionalizing dispatch. Um, and I will support the budget motion as made. Thank you, David. Other comments? Discussion? Sarah? I just want to quickly say, I think if I personally had a job and someone said, I'm going to fire you in two years, uh, that wouldn't make me feel happy. I would probably leave right then. So I sort of feel like if it's inevitability, it's, it's, it's maybe tough love, but it seems to me kinder and more conscientious to do what needs to be done now. And furthermore, if this is an, uh, a, a, thing, a phenomenon occurring across the state and everybody is doing it, the jobs are here now that won't be here in two years. So I feel like, I, I feel a little bit better that all four of these people, <clears throat> it looks like are gonna be able to get jobs. So on some level, I feel like if it's gonna happen, it's good it's happening now. It seems to me um, kinder. So I too will be supporting it. Thanks, sir. Comments, discussion? I, I uh, would just echo the comments of both Sarah and David. I do plan to support the motion uh, to approve this municipal budget. I certainly never envisioned that when I ran for town council, I would be faced with a decision that would involve having to let four positions go. Uh, I have no personal contact with any of the individual dispatchers, but I've heard nothing but great things about them. I am more than sure that they do a terrific job for our community and it saddens me as I think Mary Page mentioned this is sad uh, but I do think we've got to uh, adhere to the themes or the the directions that we've we've heard over and over again from people in our town about efficiency watching tax dollars um, scrutiny of the municipal budget and working with surrounding communities to see if we can save costs and if I thought that regionalization would result in a decrease in the safety of services, if you will, that we provide, that I wouldn't vote in favor of this, but everything I've heard leads me to believe the services will, be, will not be the same, but I still believe that the safety of our citizens uh, will, will definitely be taken care of, so I will support this budget. Thanks, David. Other comments? Can I say one more thing? Um, I, I guess my position is I'm not 100% sure that a regionalization of dispatch needs to be inevitable. Um, because, I mean, what I hear about are, is that technology will bring us closer to people in situations. Um, and I, I'll just say that when I worked uh, in corporate America, it was during the time when we were looking at moving things, uh, moving functions offshore. And uh, it was everybody else is doing it. And because it's going to make things more cost effective, because it's going to make things, uh, it'll make the uh, processes more efficient. Many of those situations, what ended up happening is that it didn't become more efficient. It didn't become better. Over time, it became more costly. And that's one of the things I, I really worry about is that do we really know the future cost, and um, and when you start moving uh, functions away from people, you start losing that essence of what's really, really needed or wanted. And I sat in dispatch and I watched what they do. It isn't just about 911 calls. It's not just about emergencies. It's about a lot of different things that go on. And if you look at all of the functions that are performed by dispatch, 
We need to know, and this, is, this was my point in the email that I sent along, we need to know where those functions are going to be performed, and if they aren't going to be performed, what are the implications? And that's, that's really what I think we need to understand. Will they be performed? If not, what's the implication to the citizens? And I don't know if you went through the tasks that are performed by, that, by the dispatch function, but there are a lot of them who's <coughs> going to absorb them. And it's not one and a half clerks. It's got to be police officers, other people who are going to absorb those, or they aren't going to be done. Thank you, Penny. Ann? I've tried to look at this question very carefully. It's a really important question for the town. It's especially important for the people who are personally involved. Um, I try to look at the facts in whatever decision I make on behalf of the council. I've looked at the safety issues. I've looked at the cost issues. I'm a believer in consolidation where it makes sense and is in the interest of citizens. I think the plan as outlined by the manager and endorsed by the police chief and the fire chief is a good plan. I think it addresses all the questions that of, of various support services and, and other issues that, um, that I've had and that other people have had. I've been impressed by the comprehensive level of it. I think service will be as good or better for citizens. I do believe it's a core function of government to, pro to protect citizen safety, and so I take that really seriously. But it's, it's also um, in the interest of citizens financially to do this. Um, and as I said, it weighed hev heavily with me that both chiefs endorse the plan. I think they are men of integrity, and unlike one or two of the speakers uh, intimated tonight, I don't think that their recommendation of this plan has anything to do with who their boss is or what their boss said. I've, I've seen them disagree with their boss a few times before, and I think they believe in this plan. They know it's a difficult plan, and that they are, I know, very concerned about the personal impacts on people that they know and they work with but I think they've stepped up to the plate and made hard decisions, and I think the council next needs to step up to the plate and make the hard decisions too. So I will be supporting the municipal budget for that reason. Thank you, Ann. I just find it uh, interesting that the two people who have served in our public service departments are the two that have the strongest concerns about consolidating dispatch, but that's, uh, that's the way it is. Other comments? Discussion. Seeing none, uh, all in favor of the motion uh, to approve uh, the fiscal year 2010 municipal budget as seconded. Two, three, four. Opposed? Show the vote to four to two, please, in favor. Thank you. Um, And would you like to be looked to for each of these next several? Sure. I mean, I can do that as finance chair. Okay. Uh, item 71-2009, Cumberland County Tax Assessment. I would move that the council hereby approves the calendar year 2009 Cumberland County Tax Assessment and approves the appropriation of $967,000. $967,750 as part of the fiscal year 2010 budget and tax assessment. Moved. Second. Second by Councillor Backer. Discussion on the motion? There shouldn't be. This is pretty much a, an item that's handed to us and we have to pay. So, all in favor of the motion? Show it to be unanimous. <coughs> item 72 2009, uh, community services budget. I would move that the Town Council approves the fiscal year 2010 Community Services Budget and appropriates $1,077,933 as the total expenditure amount. The estimated revenues are $951,533 with $126,400 to be included as part of the fiscal year 2010 budget and tax assessment. Second. Moved and seconded. Discussion on the motion? 
Seeing none, all in favor of the motion? Show it to be unanimous, 6-0. Item 73-2009, Homestead Exemption. I would move that the council approves the fiscal year 2010 locally funded homestead exemption with $220,000 $220, as the total expenditure amount. The $220,000 is to be included as part of the fiscal year 2010 budget and tax assessment. Second. Seconded by Councillor Lennon. Discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor? Unanimous. Item 74 2009, uh, property tax levy limit. I, I would move that in accordance with 30A MRSA section 5721 A, the town of Cape Elizabeth hereby increases the property tax levy limit for municipal services to $5,726,154. I'll second that just to get in the minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor? <coughs> Unanimous. Item 75-2009, allocation of town undesignated fund balance to the school. I would move that the council authorizes a transfer of $200,000 from the town undesignated fund balance to the school undesignated fund balance for the purpose of reducing the net to taxation in the fiscal year 2010 school department budget. This vote is contingent, and this is part of my motion also, this vote is contingent upon the Cape Elizabeth School Department having a reduction in the fiscal year 2010 main school subsidy of at least $163,500 from the budgeted amount in fiscal year 2009. If the reduction is between $163,500 and $363,500, the transfer will be 100% of the amount above $163,500 that is less than the previous year. If the reduction is more than $363,500, the amount transferred shall be $200,000. Second. Seconded by Council Lennon. Discussion on the move. David? I need an explanation from either our finance chair or our town manager on this uh, contingency references to $163,500 and $363,500. Somehow, I, I'm, the significance of those are lost on me. The, uh, through you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> <laughs> Could you state your name and address? Yeah, I would, anyway. Um, the school budget originally had a contingency of $70,000. When the health insurance increase uh, went from a 20% increase down to a 0% increase, one of the things they did is they put $163,500 additional into their contingency above the $70,000. The thinking of this motion is, is that the first monies used to, to balance the gap should be the additional amount that they put into the contingency when they thought they had more money and they hadn't specifically allocated because that's really what contingency is for. So those would be the first dollars in and taking care of the problem. The, the, the next dollars in would be 100% of whatever it is of the 200,000 and the 163,500, the 363,500, 100% of whatever that difference is. But it's capped at 200,000 even if the, the fund balance, the, the state school subsidy, ended up not being the 504,000 decrease that's anticipated, but if it was 600 under this motion, for this purpose, it's capped at 200. Which is not to say someone couldn't come back at some later point, but, but this motion caps it at 200. David? And the other night at our finance committee meeting was the number that the school department offered to contribute of its total contingency, $163,500. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, they, they, went, they didn't have a formal vote. They went around at the finance committee meeting and had a consensus, but they, they ended up with a formal vote at a later meeting. Yes, that was a straw poll. The, the, the meeting, the joint meeting, the workshop meeting, the finance committee meeting, that was just a straw poll. 
because they couldn't be taking a formal vote in that meeting. But then at last Monday's school board meeting at 7.30 in the morning, they did take a formal vote and the budget that they voted on was built upon the assumption of using that 163.5 to reduce the $504,000 gap. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. I will say that I uh, didn't make this, or I'm not going to make this decision uh, without concern. I think the concern was voiced by the, the citizen in the back of the room that uh, dedicating undesignated funds prior to the budget is, is not good budget practice. In fact, it's not budgeting. It's, it's doing something else. But I think uh, what it came down to for me is that these extraordinary times have, have called for extraordinary measures. And uh, ultimately, uh, and I, I lost sleep over this. I really did, because I, it, something just rubs me the wrong way about it. But uh, what it boiled down to me is that we have to pull together. That's, that's the strongest need we have in this community right now is to pull together. And I think the best way we can do that is, is to help each other. And I'm willing to do this. I, I did have uh, Ann had her hand up, and then, then you, Penny. I, I would agree with Chairman Rowe that I've had to think about this one a lot because I, as I said, when we were talking about the $200,000 for the fiscal nine, the contribution to the fiscal nine budget, I of course said, well, I, you know, this is only because it's an unexpected problem that has come up and we should never do this in advance of budgeting. And I have taken myself to task because this does fly in that previous statement of mine. But I do agree with Jim that uh, the $504,000 that the state just sort of pulled out from under the schools, the school department, was, it wasn't in this fiscal year. It's for next fiscal year, but it was entirely a total sandbag job. I mean, it was really unexpected by anybody. I, I came to that last meeting fully expecting to support the school budget and, and feeling good about it. And we had a 0% tax rate, and I thought everything was going to be as good as it can be in this economy. But um, I do feel that these are extraordinary times. And I would say, however, uh, and I may live to rue the words, but uh, this 200,000 is the only 200,000 there is. You know, if, if the state comes back and says, you know, there's another, you've lost a million or whatever, I, we can't keep pulling it out. In my mind, we cannot keep pulling it out of undesignated surplus. This is it. Whether it got used in fiscal 9 or whether it gets used in fiscal 10, that's sort of it. We can't keep going back to that well because we have to think about uh, other contingencies that may hit in the coming year. So I'm willing to do this even though it flies in the face of good budgeting practice. I do it with some trepidation, but I do think it's the right thing to do, so I will be supporting it. I can't add to that because that's basically how I felt. It's a real tug because this is, it, I feel like it's premature to start drawing on dollars. So, but, uh, it's a tough decision, so I'll support it. Other discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor of the motion? 6-0. Item 76-2009, um, school department budget. I'm, what, I'm going to let somebody else make a motion on this one. Give somebody else a turn. Okay. If, if there is a motion to be made. If there's a motion to be made. We are nearing uh, a curfew for discussing new uh, items, but we are still within the, the 1030 time limit, so uh, we can proceed for a, for a few more minutes anyway, and that will be up to the council to decide if we want to go any further. Uh, would anyone like to make a motion or discuss this item 76-2009 tonight, or we, would we want to put this off until our special meeting, which is scheduled for April 30th. I think we should discuss it tonight and get it done. Very good. Particularly in light of all the people who showed up and gave their evening up. That's just me. David? Well, I'm 
new to this and I had sort of the exact opposite reaction, which is we've been here for several hours. We have heard from members of the public um, about a lot of issues, including the school budget, but I, I would be inclined to hold off our discussion until April 30th. But, um, How do others feel? Curious? David? Hey, I'm willing to address it briefly. And again, we've had a lot of people come and a lot of people are interested in sort of what, what direction we're generally headed on this. Mm -hmm. and I'm willing to speak my piece on that. Okay. Others? I'm willing to hang in tonight if, I mean, I, I appreciate people hanging around for so long. <laughs> so, I mean, I could do it either night. I'll go with the will of the council on whatever, but okay. I'll do it tonight because people are okay. waiting. We'll be very brief. Okay. And are you good with that? That's fine. David, you okay with that? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Uh, who would like to begin discussion or put a motion on the floor? Or? Just on, on this, we don't have a formal motion prepared because we, Pauline Portria needs to prepare that after she gets a lot of information from the state. So, you know, if someone wanted to make a motion simply to recommend to April 30th a budget that that uh, is either the 0.6% tax increase or whatever else that might be, that would probably be a motion that would cover your discussion. Thank you. So moved. <laughs> <laughs> Second. Moved and seconded. Discussion on the motion. Would you repeat that, Mr. Manager? I, I think what Councillor Lennon moved was to <laughs> to recommend to the meeting on on April 30th a school budget increase that translates to a tax increase of 0.6 percent. Thank you. Discussion on the motion. Because I'm new to this, can you explain what? Okay, so. On the 30th, if we, if we vote for that, on the 30th, what will transpire? Um, we can't have a formal vote until the 30th because the state law says okay. it has to be within okay. 10 days of the town voting on it. Okay. So on that night, we'll actually raise our hands and either approve it or not approve it. Okay, so and we're I not allowed to do that tonight, but we can sort of get a feel of what direction we're headed in. And if things continue to be as they are now, it looks like we'll be voting on whether we're going to put forward a 0.6% increase mm -hmm. in the tax base in order to fund the shortfall that now the, the school currently faces of 145000 because the state took the money away. Right. Um, so I guess now we're not really voting. We're just going to maybe state our position. Okay. To clarify. We just, we just have to, as Sarah says, we just have to have a motion so we can have discussion. discussion. So, but your final commitment, your vote can't take place until within 10 days of the public okay. referendum. So this is almost, it's akin to sort of setting a number for a public hearing, even though there's not going to be another public hearing April 30th. But it's just setting a number for us to talk about voting on, on November, oh no, sorry, not November, on <laughs> whenever that is. April 30th. April 30th, thank you. Thank you. Well, I'll state my position. Um, I'm prepared to vote for a 0.6% increase. I thought everyone who came here tonight and spoke uh, in support of the schools was more eloquent and made a lot of sense, and I couldn't say it any better. And um, the fact that all of us praised the school board and thought it was a great budget, which I do think it is, um, before the state took the money away, also is compelling. <coughs> I do think it's an extremely responsible, extremely frugal um, budget that the school board presented to us. And the cuts are not small. I actually have a list here of the cuts that they've had to make this year and the cuts they've made over the past 10 years. I won't bore everyone reading it, but it's quite lengthy. So I'm loath to have them go back and try to cut any more. Um, and the only other point that did not come out in the public hearing that I'd like to quickly say is that um, I'm not sure everyone's aware of the magnitude of the parent tax that parents with children in the school now um, endure, in which they pay for more and more of the activities, the field trips, the many, many of the sporting events, um, in many cases supplies in the classroom and even textbooks. It's not at all unusual for a family to pay upward of $500 per child in a single year. 
And so when we talk about people on fixed income or struggling or losing their jobs, I think we need to keep those folks in mind too. They're, they're, it's not insignificant, in fact, it's huge. So to spread, to spread the responsibility to all the, the folks in Cape Elizabeth with a little bit of a tax increase strikes me as fair given <clears throat> the large extra tax that some, some or most parents are, are asked to shoulder. Thanks, sir. Other discussion? David, was that a? <laughs> um, I'm willing to support sending the school board's proposed budget um, with its resulting tax increase to the voters. Uh, but with the caveat or tag that I don't support it. Um, it and I suspect that there may not be much voter tolerance for um, a tax increase of any account, uh, of any amount, regardless of how modest. And one of the speakers, <coughs> one of the speakers said tonight that the difference between 0% and 0.6% is um, probably an issue of principle. And I think it may very well be an issue of principle with the voters this year in this recessionary environment. The dollar difference is not terribly significant. Um, but again, I think that in this environment um, of recession and in this environment where the uh, municipal side of the budget has um, dug very deep to ensure a zero tax increase, that the voters may very well reasonably expect that the school department uh, should do the same. Um, and I guess we'll see. That's the benefit of sending this out to the voters. You know, last year we sent the town council's recommended school board budget to the voters first. Uh, it was rejected. Then we sent the school board's recommended budget. That was rejected. <laughs> and we met somewhere in the middle. This year I'm willing to send the school board, the school department's uh, budget out first you know, rather than ours. And um, <coughs> the voting booth is indeed the great equalizer and we'll let the voters tell us whether 0.6% is something that they're willing to accept or whether they will insist upon a zero tax increase. But I'm willing to send the school's recommended budget out. Yeah. Um. I want to share my thoughts on this, and I'm, I'm aware it's late, but I'd rather get it over with now than have to, you know, wait and give my remarks later on, on the 30th. That way everybody knows sort of what I'm thinking, and maybe it will forestall questions. Um, first of all, I want to thank everybody who contacted me about the budget. There's a lot that unites us. As somebody said at the public hearing tonight, there's a lot more that unites us in this town than separates us. and. Um, that is our, our common love of Cape Elizabeth and uh, wanting to do the right thing for our fellow citizens. Um, I think now is a difficult time to increase spending and to increase citizens' tax burden. We're in the worst recession since the Great Depression. The consumer price index is only 0.2%. And all sectors of the economy, the private sector, the government sector, the nonprofit sector, they're all feeling the pain. So our challenge as the council, as I, it's my mantra, I guess I say it over and over again, is to balance all the important competing <coughs> needs uh, that our citizens have for services in this town, uh, but also keeping in mind the need to keep property taxes affordable so that our community can continue to be a place where all kinds of citizens, rich ones, poor ones, young ones, old ones, people with kids in the school system, people without kids in the school system, and so on. All those folks can afford to live here. That way we'll be able to keep some diversity in this town and have our community not turn into an enclave of wealthy, older people, many from out of state, um, you know, a place where people have second homes. Um, the municipal and school revenues are gonna be down in fiscal 10 and that's just really hard because our needs are going up. Great challenge. 
the municipal community services and county budgets are all going to decrease spending and have lower tax rates in fiscal 10. And we've had to make a lot of popular, unpopular, excuse me, unpopular, painful yet necessary cuts. And we just did one in the on dispatch a few minutes ago. We've tried to do that to keep taxes down. I must say I've been very impressed. The school department and the school board have worked very hard on their budget, and I appreciate it. I think it's, it's been a good process this year. It's had a few bumps here and there, but I think it's been a good process. For a while, it looked as though they were going to be able to come in with a 0% tax increase, a budget enabling a 0% tax increase for the town as a whole. I planned to support that, but that was not to be because the state came along um, and uh, killed us by cutting $504,000 at the last minute. The council's going to kick in 200 grand. The school board kept their contingency amount down to 70,000 to keep uh, to, to free up $163,000. So, unfortunately, those moves are not enough. 140. Thousand dollars of the 504 is left to be covered. If the schools cut more, we can achieve a 0% tax rate change. If the citizens cover it all with taxes, that will be a 0.6% overall tax increase to be covered. And that's to be covered 99% by homeowners, not by, because we don't have any commercial tax base to speak of here. <coughs> Several citizens mentioned Yarmouth and places like that. Most towns around here are not like Cape Elizabeth in, in that they do have commercial tax base to sort of lay off some of their tax burden onto. So whatever we vote for as a community will be borne by the homeowners, the, the residential homeowners of this community. And that's something I have to try and keep in mind. I thought last week a couple of the school board members had what I thought was a good suggestion. The, the, uh, the idea in their school board meeting was to have school staff share the pain, as they put it. Right now, the average teacher is scheduled to receive over a 5% salary increase in fiscal, 10, in fiscal 10, moving the average salary from $50,380 to $53,033. And that's just the average. Some get more, some get less. But that's just looking at the aggregate numbers. If the teachers and the ed techs kicked in, and frankly, if everybody kicked in to share the pain, it would be even less. If they took only part of their raises, I'm not talking about cutting their pay, I'm not talking about taking away all of their raises, but they, if they kicked in something to cover that 140,000, they could still get a 3.5% increase. And the, and the taxpayers would have a 0% tax increase. I thought that was a nifty idea that they brought up that two of the school board members brought up last week, but four of the, of the seven school board members uh, disagreed, and um, a majority, they were a majority, and they chose not to do that path, and they instead they proposed this 0% tax increase, net effect tax increase for the taxpayers. I can't agree. I think everybody sharing the pain makes more sense. I suspect I'll be voting against this budget on April 30th, since I don't think this is the time in this economy to be raising people's taxes. I will say that reasonable people can disagree on these issues. I do appreciate all the input I've heard, and I have truly listened carefully to what everybody's had to say, because it's a difficult issue. Um, I've heard many compelling stories from school parents who are concerned about the increased amounts they have to pay in fees, but I've also heard from senior citizens and other people who are, and, and some young parents who are in fear of losing their homes, they're, they're, they're one of the two parents has lost a job, and <coughs> things are really tight for them and they can't afford tax increases. Ultimately, the citizens of Cape Elizabeth are going to decide this in the May 12th referendum about how much they want the school budget to be and how much they want their taxes, if, if at all, to increase. I will respect their decision, whatever it is. We're all working for a common goal. Um, to keep Cape Elizabeth a wonderful community, but I cannot support <coughs> the school budget with a tax that, that would lead us with an overall tax increase. Thank you. Thanks, Anne. Other discussion? Dave? Um, 
it, it was uh, thoroughly depressing to have as, uh, on the eve of our uh, uh, joint workshop with the school board and the town council to have a, a budget that appeared to be one that could have been embraced by every member of the town council that was there at the workshop uh, as well as the school board and we would have had at least for the first time in recent memory a, a, a school budget uh, process that would uh, have been a fairly uniting event as opposed to a dividing one and I agree with some of the commentary from Ann and others that uh, I, I don't view this divide as um, maybe I'm just being optimistic as acrimonious or divisive as what we've experienced in the past. I think this is an issue that reasonable minds can disagree. Um, uh, I understand the desire to rein in taxes. Uh, I certainly understand and appreciate some of the commentary about struggling families or senior citizens on fixed incomes. But I also hear the other side, uh, which uh, is uh, also coming through loud and clear, that people in our town, whether they're young or old, really value a strong school system. Uh, and that's one of the main reasons why I decided to run for town council and it doesn't mean I'm willing to just throw money uh, recklessly around. I, I think that the school board has done a phenomenal job this time around uh, in trying to meet the goal of uh, essentially what would have been a 0% uh, tax increase overall when you combine both municipal and school spending. Uh, I just think about the, the teachers and the staff and the, the people who deal with our children on a daily basis and the kind of message that we continue to send them as a town, uh, which is uh, we, uh, we, we say sort of broadly and conceptually we value education, but, but when it comes time to talk about funding these positions and funding these programs, all of a sudden it's no way, it's just too much. And I, I would just love us to reach a point where people in our town are willing to show more support on a consistent basis for our schools when it comes time to, their po uh, to dealing with their pocketbooks. I, I certainly am uh, cognizant of those folks who, uh, who may view a $27 per year increase as significant. I understand that. But I think there are programs out there as was highlighted by one of the earlier commentators tonight, to help those folks. And I've actually heard from a number of citizens who said, I'd be willing uh, to contribute to a fund to deal with individuals who cannot accommodate a $20, $27, or $50 per year tax increase this time around. Um, and I, there's just an incredibly generous spirit in our town. And uh, I think that we would be pleasantly surprised if indeed folks, more folks started struggling, there'd be those among us who'd be willing to come to their assistance. Um, just on the, the quote unquote parent tax, uh, it is true. I mean, every time my wife and I turn around, we're paying $300 for a uh, Latin II class. We're paying $65 for a participation fee in, in a sport. I'm, I'm happy to pay those. I really am, but I think there are a lot of parents out there who may not be in as fortunate a position as I am, at least right now, uh, to be able to afford that. And I, I think if we, if we keep sort of going down the road of cut, 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 we're going to find a lot of parents and school-aged children are disenfranchised and won't be able uh, to fully participate in what CAPE has to offer. So uh, I am prepared to send the 0.6% budget to the voters uh, during our vote on April 30th. Thanks, Dave. Hey. <coughs> go first? No? Sure, I can. Um, before the, uh, the state withdrew its uh, funding uh, due to the school funding formula, I was fully prepared to vote for the school budget as they'd originally proposed because it brought us to that 0.0, .0 bottom line uh, in the right-hand corner of our performers. Obviously, the, the withdrawal of half a million dollars changes the situation. Um, I said at our last uh, joint workshop, budget workshop, that I would like to get back to zero percent. Um, the two numbers that I've heard are 0.6 and zero percent. Um, I'd like to throw out a proposal that has worked the last couple of years, and that would be to find the average of the two extremes, which in this case are not really extreme, they're fairly close together, but if we threw out a 0.3 percent increase, I could see everybody saying, huh, what's What's the big deal? You know, it's, it's, it's so close to 0.6. I think it might be something that everybody can get behind. So the suggestion is purely political. 
Um, it's in the interest of bringing people together in this town, like I said, which I think should be our priority right now. Uh, we had a year last year from hell, and I frankly don't want to see another one. And I would like to see us pull together uh, on, this, on this budget. I think 0.3% is, is doable for most people under the circumstances. So I will oppose the motion and hope that people might embrace a 0.3. I'm not going to respond to the point three at this point in time. Um, I agree with a lot of what uh, Anne has, has said, and it goes back to uh, a comment that, um, oh, I can't remember her first name, Mrs. Townsend, she works at Anthem, and that the, um, the private sector is having to cut uh, jobs, cut salaries, make a lot of um, concessions in order to keep businesses running. And um, uh, I was sorry that I was away on the 30th and they had the uh, uh, combined meeting uh, with the school board because um, I would have hoped they would have voted for is there a way that we can kind of push back and, and, and ask that uh, the administrators or the teachers just look at could they take um, a little bit of a uh, reduction in their in their raises because it's um, it's a lot of money at this point in time to be expecting that you're going to get a, a wage increase at this point. The other thing is is that we're contributing two hundred thousand dollars, which is taxpayer money, to. Uh, um, to the schools, and we're committing to that. And um, I grapple with this because I truly believe as a community and a society, we have an obligation to young people to provide an education so that they can move forward and uh, be productive and successful citizens of the world. And so my challenge is uh, to balance those needs as well as the needs of other citizens in the town. Um, and I think what I hear citizens saying, it isn't about 0.6, it isn't about zero, it isn't about 0.3, it's about am I, getting, am I getting a return on my investment? And I think the reason that we come back to the table every year and talk about is it 6, is it 1.2, is it this, is it that, it's because there are there are people who feel they aren't getting a return on their investment, and I think it's time, and I know that this isn't my realm because I will be overstepping my bounds when I make this statement. I think that we as a town need to make a commitment that we need to look at ways to um, gain efficiencies, uh, to identify ways of doing business differently, because in any bureaucracy there are there are efficiencies. And a school is just another bureaucracy. The town is a bureaucracy. We have to step back and we have to look at being creative and uh, looking at ways that we can really do business differently in all parts of the town. Uh, will I support 0.6 increase at this point in time? I have to say no. Might I come to the meeting on the 30th with a different uh, view because I've heard from people that can change this opinion? What I would say at this point in time is that unless we step back and we make significant changes, I can't support the 0.6 increase. Thank you, Penny. Any other discussion on the motion? David? Um, Mr. Chairman, I move that this uh, discussion be tabled until our next um, scheduled meeting on Thursday, April 30. Okay. Second. Move and second to table further discussion and, uh, and a vote until the special meeting on April 30. Uh, there's no debate on a motion to table, and the motion to table takes precedence. So all in favor of the motion to table? So to be unanimous. Thank you. Um, I know it is getting late. The manager has requested that we uh, act on a, a couple items here. One is the uh, special funds balances uh, and block 
and the other item is the uh, public safety answering point, uh, item 94-2009. Uh, is it okay with the council that we... Uh, Someone to suspend the rule. Make, make okay, suspend we'll, we'll need a motion back. to suspend the council rules because uh, our rules say that we should... So moved. To suspend the council rules. Uh, Ann? Second. And I'd like to make a, a comment, please. Discussion. Can, is there discussion? Sure, uh, on moved and second to suspend, suspend the council rules so that we may take up uh, a couple more items here. Uh, any discussion on that motion? My discussion is I know it's late, but I'd rather whip through as much as we can tonight rather than to have to. This is just my personal preference. I'd rather get it over with than uh, then come back another night. Just uh, if I, maybe items where there's unanimity. We you can, can move forward on an items that there isn't. You can leave the discussion. That would, that's a good idea, I think. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes. Dave? I'd like to take up the items, only, only the budget items that are essential for, for calendaring purposes and, move forward. And, okay. and leave the others to another night. Okay. Um, so we have a motion, and it's been seconded to suspend the, the council rules. So we may uh, discuss other items. All in favor? Uh, unanimous. Thank you. Um, Motion will be to table 77 to 79. Okay. Um, I'd now like to entertain a motion to tables number, uh, table item numbers 77-2009 uh, to 79. Before you accept a tabling motion, just because, Mr. Chairman, because once you accept that motion, then we can't ask any questions or mm -hmm. anything, um, can I ask if, for instance, the school budget validation vote one, is there a time limit for printing ballots or anything like that? If we, if we hold off... Really nice people, to know if that language, yeah. That, well, that's yeah. why I was wondering okay. if we should deal with item 78 okay. tonight. Okay. Good, good case. Sounds good. Just in case. Um, so we, we, uh, repeat for me which items Just you would like. Just table 77. Okay. Now. Could we have a motion to table item 77-2009, the general fund budget? So Please. moved. Move, second. Moved and seconded. Uh, motion to table. Has no debate. All in favor of the motion? Unanimous. And I'm sorry, that was to table it until April 30th? Until April 30th, I'm okay. sorry. Um, I'd like to make a motion on 78. Please do. On item 78, I'd like to recommend that the motion below, I, I'm sorry, well, that we, oh, well, okay, maybe I'm, maybe, I'm, maybe I don't want to make this motion, Michael. I thought you just indicated that you would like to know what the. You, you don't actually vote on this to the 30th, but it'd be really nice to know if this so ballot what, language is acceptable. What the fee, okay. So, and what the real issue with the ballot wording has to be what it, what it is, uh, the question. Yes. But the too high, acceptable, too low is up to the council. Okay, then, I, then I'd like to make a motion to approve, knowing that this will be tabled in a minute, but I'd like to motion, make a motion to approve the warrant for a validation vote for the fiscal 10, 2010 approved school budget. The pol polls would be open at Cape High School on May 12th from 7 a.m. till 8 p.m. Prevailing time, I don't know what that means. And the warrant for said vote shall be signed by the municipal officers. The question wording on the ballot would be, and this is mandated by law, I believe, do you favor approving the town of Cape Elizabeth school budget for the upcoming school year that was adopted at the latest school budget meeting of the town council? And that would be the April 30th meeting. Um, there are two answers to that, yes or no. And then in addition, there would be an advisory portion of the ballot following the main question, and that advisory question would read, I find the school budget adopted at the April 30th, 2009 Town Council school budget meeting to be, and three, three options, too high, acceptable, or too low. Second. Moved and seconded. Discussion on the motion. Yeah. David? I just want to make sure I understand why we might be considering tabling this. I mean, it, 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 this is the form of the ballot that we would use regardless of which budget we vote to send to the yes. voters on April 30th, right? So, so why would we want to table this? I agree with you. It, it's simply 
you know, we need to know that you agree to this language, but you don't actually adopt the budget. You don't, you know. Right, but this is just the language for the vote. Just I suppose think. you could do it, but well, can't I, we just vote on it I now? I want to check the law, but I, I, you could do it. I don't want to. Doing it sort of post, you know, pre. Well, it does. Let's just do it on the 34th line. Does yeah. it just? We'll get the ballot printed based on the consensus we've heard tonight. That's all I'm trying to figure out. Okay. Uh, okay. That's fine. With so, me. is the formatting of the ballot okay with everybody? So, if everybody, yeah. if anyone has an objection, they should speak now. Right. right. This was the language that was used last time. Okay. Yes. Very good. The date was there. So we'll cancel the, the motion and. So start. I'll withdraw my motion. We had a straw vote. And and, uh, and make motion to table it till April 30th. Okay. Second. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Unanimous. <laughs> Okay, uh, item 79 2009 allocation of town designated fund balance to the community services account. Uh, this amounted to $27,249. For the purpose of funding the community services deficit fund balance in place at the beginning of fiscal year 2009. Move to accept the motion as written and under item 79. Second. Moved and seconded. Discussion on the motion. I have Any? a question. My question has to do with why is there a $27,249 deficit in, a, in the um, community services? 17,000 of it was because of uh, separation pay that the school department pays administrators, uh, when, and that was uh, incurred when Sue Weatherby retired. Uh, the balance is as a result of uh, Cape Mortgage uh, not paying the anticipated rent lease amount uh, when they went out of business and the, the place was vacant. So severance is covered. Okay. Um, other discussion on the motion? I think there was a motion. Yes, it was. Yeah, it was. It's been <laughs> All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Mr. Chair, could I make a motion to consider item 80, 81, 82, 83, 84, 85, and 86 on block? You may. Second. Sense. Moved and seconded. Discussion on the motion to consider those items uh, together as, as one vote. Makes sense. Any discussion? Seeing none. All in favor of considering the items on block? Unanimous. And Do you have a follow-up motion? Yes, then I'd like to move that we accept these. And for the public, I won't read all the numbers, but this is the fiscal 10 proposed rescue budgets for the rescue fund, the sewer fund, the Spurwink Church Fund, the Riverside Cemetery, budget, the Fort Williams Park Capital budget, the Portland Headlight budget, and the Thomas Jordan Trust budget. Moved. Second. And second. Seconded. Discussion on the motion? All in favor of the motion? Unanimous. Item 87, if it's not approved tonight, will cost us revenue. I'd because the, the, the fee increases could go into place the next day. Mr. Chairman, if I may, I'd like to approve, make a motion to approve the following rescue fees as outlined under item number 87. Second. Moved and seconded to accept the uh, adjustments in the rescue fees. Discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Can, can we go for 88? Can, I, I'd like to move that we approve the following charge for proposed health insurance review committee as outlined in the packet. We have a motion to uh, establish and charge a committee to uh, investigate health insurance. Uh, second. Moved and seconded. Sarah? I'd like to defer this to, uh, so we can have a conversation about it at our next meeting. Then I'll withdraw my motion. Thanks. Okay, okay with so, everybody? So do we, do we have to move to defer it or anything? Uh, or will it just show up? Probably just, just table it to the next meeting. And it'll... I move to table it to the next meeting. Second. Okay. Can, yeah, can we uh, jump to item 94? Oh, well. Wait, I, did we and, have to uh, table the balance? Okay. Did we have uh, to vote on that? 
We have a vote on. We have a mo motion, I believe, in a second to to table this one item first, David. Oh, okay. Then, Sorry. Okay, that's okay. Yeah. Apologies. Um, all in favor of the motion? Unanimous. Now I'd offer uh, or I'd entertain your motion, Dave. You would um, I move that we uh, take item 94, 2009, out of order. Second. Move that we take, uh, moved and seconded that we take item 94 2009 out of order and consider it at this point. Discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor of the motion? Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, that was just to, uh, to take it out of order. Yeah. All in favor? Unanimous. Yeah, we need, to, we need to move, have a motion on the item itself. Yeah. I'd like to move that we authorize the town manager to sign an assignment and assumption agreement with the City of South Portland and the City of Portland, which assigns the rights and obligations contained in the January 25, 2007 Public Safety Answering Point Agreement from the City of South Portland to the City of Portland. Second. The motion seconded by Councillor Backer. Discussion on the motion? Mike, could you just briefly yeah. tell us what this is about? I, I'm when sorry, we, I just can't recall. <coughs> when we established the, the public safety answering point, the 911 answering service, right. it was originally with South Portland. South Portland then transferred their PSAP along with ours to Portland. Uh, so this merely has the, the provisions and the agreements that were once with South Portland assigned to Portland, all the same provisions except it reads Portland. So it's an agreement that assigns the responsibilities. Okay, thank you. Further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor? Unanimous. Uh, just been informed by the clerk that we also need to act uh, this month on item number 95-2009, the annual dog warrant. We need to get those uh, miscreant dogs off the streets. Uh, I'd like to, to move that we approve a warrant to the animal control officer dir directing the ACO to send a notice to owners and keepers of unlicensed dogs. Is that, do, is that the motion you need? Second. Moved and seconded. We have a list uh, that was dropped on our, in front of our places tonight of the, uh, the offending canines. Um, discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor? Unanimous, thank you. Mr. Chairman, so can we just I'm not making a tabling motion, but can we defer the rest of these? Or, I don't know, do, you need to or do I we want a, to deal with them? I just had a, I mean, I, I, I certainly have heard from a lot of folks, uh, at least in the Shore, Shore Road Pathway Committee report, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we're not gonna discuss it substantively, but does it, just by accepting the report, then do we get that sort of into the pipeline for the next available workshop? It, it just, yep. I hate to not just move it along. Make a motion. So I would make a motion. Uh, that we accept with appreciation for further consideration the report of the Shore Road Pathway Committee and to refer the plan to a future town council workshop. Second. Moved and seconded. Excuse me. Discussion on the motion? Seeing none. Uh, well, I would, I would just like to add a comment that I, I want to thank the, uh, uh, on behalf of the council, thank again the, the Shore Road Pathway. They put in a lot of work on this, uh, on this project. Uh, they've been thorough. They've been as transparent as you can possibly be in the process. They've involved citizens, the, butter, the butters. The, the design team, I think, has done a great job in assembling uh, something that, that it goes a long way toward meeting the charge that they were given. Uh, you know, whether it did or not, I think will remain to be seen, and that will be brought up in discussion. But these folks, uh, I think, deserve our uh, unmitigated appreciation for the hard work that they put in. And, uh, so I'd just like to add that before our vote. But uh, all in favor? Unanimous? Do you need the street thing? Uh, Mr. Chairman, okay, just street to, to move this along, if, if it's continuing to go in order on item 90-2009, mm -hmm. I'd like to make a motion that we accept with appreciation for further consideration the report of the Fort Williams Advisory Commission regarding the Goddard Mansion and to refer the report to a future town council workshop. Second. Moved and seconded to accept and refer uh, the report of the Fort Williams Advisory Commission on the Goddard Mansion status. Sarah? 
I'm oh, sorry, I'm supposed to vote. Already voting. <laughs> no, I'm voting. Okay, all in, all in favor. <laughs> I think we want Nobody to wants to discuss anything at this point. Uh, is that unanimous? Um, yes. Okay. With apologies, I'm going to have to leave. I have to be in uh, Booth Bay very early in the morning. So thank you. I for will leave you all to finish the agenda. Thank you for I'll staying wait. this long, David. I appreciate your participation. Hey, Mr. Chairman, if I could just continue on uh, on item number 92-2009. Oh, oh, did I miss? 91. Oh, I'm sorry. I, item nine, number 91-2009. I would make a motion that we request the Fort Williams Advisory Commission to present a plan to make Fort Williams Park self-sustaining for the fiscal year beginning July 1, 2010, and that the report would be submitted, is to be submitted to the Town Council no later than January 31, 2010. Uh, Check. Move and second. David, would you like one more vote? <laughs> <laughs> uh, move and seconded. Uh, discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor of the motion? Show it to be 5-0, unanimous now. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to move uh, to item number 92 to approve the request of the Thomas Memorial Library Study Committee to extend their deadline for submission of a final report from May 1st to July 1st, 2009. Second. Moved and seconded uh, to defer uh, the receipt of the Thomas Memorial Library Study Committee until July. Discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor? 5-0, thank you. Mr. Chairman, if yes. I might, on item 93, I'd like to move adoption of the revised food maximums for general assistance as identified in Appendix B1 from the Maine Municipal Association as outlined in a memo dated February 25th, 2009. We do this every year. Moved and seconded. Uh, discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor? Five zero. Uh, Mr. Wood Chairman. Yes, sir. I'm just not sure I understand the last item, number ninety six. I mean, are we possibly going to make a motion to update the street lighting policy? But I, I guess I don't understand the I'm not next sure what steps. the proposal is. Did did you get it in your packet the guidelines? I did not. I'd propose it be tabled to the thirtieth of so moved. That will, okay. Second. Okay, moved and seconded to table item number 96-2009 until our special meeting on, on uh, April 30th. Motion to table. All in favor? Unanimous. We have everything you need. Yeah, other than a motion to adjourn. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to bother reading through the, the uh, coming meetings, uh, but there are several coming up. The first notable one is April 30th. Uh, it is the town council meeting to adopt the, the uh, budgets, uh, and the rest will follow in order. I would accept the motion to adjourn. So moved. Oops, so moved. Seconded. Moved and seconded that we adjourn. Uh, all in favor? Unanimous. Thank you all very much. For Thank you, Chiefs.